We're a little early. Look at us being prompt and on what time. Up? Yeah, no, I, 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 I mean, early memories of childhood, like cooking steak on the grill with my dad. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Yeah. And he would always like, you know, mm -hmm. as it's finishing, he would cut like a corner piece off, which is like super charred and delicious and like be like yeah, taste totally. that is it done and i'd be like fuck yeah <laughs> give, me, <laughs> give me more of that quality memories man so that was awesome so did, did did you watch your documentary i did yeah all the way up to i started talking to you guys <laughs> five minutes ago <laughs> <laughs> you yep, knew how yep. you knew how it ended oh yeah i've seen it a few times so yeah, I don't even know where to start. So, so the first one was in 2012. The first Secret Cup was in 2012, December. And and, and where was that? In Colorado. You can let yourself in. <laughs> okay. There's Chad. Yes. Here, let let, let me. Up, uh, so people are like, who are these guys? There we go. Um, all right. So the first. Sorry, where did you say it was in Seattle? It was in Colorado. Oh, Colorado. Yeah. The very first one, Dan lived in Colorado and he oh. created it. And so it was mostly a collection of the extract artists from Colorado or the companies that were, were popular over there. There were a few uh, of the bigger names from the West Coast out there too, though. So interestingly, my, my first introduction into kind of the dabbing scene and like that type of event was at the 710 Cup. Was that in 2013 or 2014? I think it was 2013. I know uh, I was pretty much inspired by us. Well, that's what I was going to say. I was like, I feel bad that I went. It seems like they just ripped off no, your no. idea. All right. No, no hard feelings. Um, Dougie was a big supporter of our event and everything. Oh, uh, uh, so du yeah. So d I know he was involved because I remember like that's where I first met um, Adam Dunn and it was at, sure. it was at, it was at uh, his spot and then at uh, the grassroots. Lab. Yeah, the Hood Lab and then Grassroots California. There you and, go. and the only thing, so I was there with my friend Ethan, and he has like a red camera, and we were like filming shit there. Nice. And all I could think of was like, it, it, it was such a, a mix of types of people. Like you had like old white grandmas and like Mexican gang members and like everything in between. And, and all I could think of was like, everybody's so like, n like, oh my gosh, like you look like you need a seat. Would you like to take my seat? Like I'll stand up. And someone's like, no, that's so nice. It like just every, every like little conversation I heard was people being super nice to each other. And all I could think of was... If you took all the weed out and threw in like hard alcohol, there'd be like fist fights and <laughs> it'd just be a totally different vibe and scene. And uh, t to like when you were talking about kind of like law enforcement, I, I, I remember I went to this event up in Ventura County and, and the sheriff's department was at the event and the sheriff was there. And I was super high and I was like, that's the dude I want to talk to. So I interviewed him okay. and, I, and I was like, what, what were your expectations as a very, you know, like this dude is not a weed dude. <laughs> like, he, yeah. he is, he is like the prototype of a, uh, of a sheriff. Right. And, uh, sober. and, and I was like, it was kind of like, what did you expect? Cause you had to be here. Like, were you like, like, fuck this, like, I don't want, like, I can't believe I have to go to some stoner event, or were you like, I'm kind of interested, like, just kind of picking his brain about stuff, and then also, now that we're like an hour or two into the event, kind of like, how, like, Everybody was chill. So I was like, it, it's kind of like a, like, imagine if you had a bunch of drunken people right now. Oh yeah, and, and and he agreed. He was like, "Yeah, no, there'd be a lot of fights. I, I like, <laughs> we'd be pulling the handcuffs out more frequently if there were alcohol here." That was routine for us. At one of the events, we we would you know 
we knew this was the case after you do it a little bit just like kind of you know you went up to this guy you already knew the answers that you're gonna get you know you know the kind of this well you kind of you know the situation right uh, we would ask we would ask the people hey how how was it you know for you and i remember one of the venues uh said to us you guys were better behaved than the special olympics <laughs> <laughs> you're like yes <laughs> yeah right so uh i can only imagine how bad it gets for for some of these places and we are definitely on the low end of uh of how bad it gets <laughs> One of the cool things about the events like that, especially, you know, in those earlier days was we never got to come together in mass in groups like that. Like Peter was saying, you know, you've got your grandmas, you got your gangsters, you got everybody. We're just happy to be around people like us. Yeah, that was part of what it was. I mean, uh, some of the personalities that were involved with our event, I, I do think helped attract a really good crowd of people. Um, and the way that we kind of ran the events also also did that. But the time that we were doing the events was also crucial. And, and the way we were doing them was going to different states. And some of these states, we were the first event they ever had. So, yeah, they were showing up. They, like, I remember Rhode Island, when we did our event in Rhode Island, they were so ready. They were waiting in line out in front of the event. They had all their stuff. Like, they were so ready. They had seen all the videos. And so they, you know, I, I'm, I go to Rhode Island every year. My entire life I've gone to Rhode Island in the summers. And 90.3 uh, is the local URI radio station. And they have this amazing, like, uh reggae like i think it's like saturday at noon show and i listen to it every saturday when i'm there and uh kingston is where uri is and years and years ago i i always talked to my brother like we need to have just a kingston like a kingston festival in kingston rhode island like bring in the uri radio station and like, I still want to do that event, like in, in some farm field. Um, yeah, the, just as you're talking about Rhode Island, I'm like, it's a fun, it's a fun spot to do something. Kind of what you're talking about is one of the lessons I learned in throwing events is that, um, you know, I got creative with some of the events and, and that can be a really fun time, but for larger scale, like concert style events, uh, just stay traditional, like go with stereotypical stoner stuff. That's what the masses want when they go to a cannabis event. You know, they're, they're basically expecting a certain kind of a thing. And if you're like, oh, we have a petting zoo. And like, if you're going for all this other, like, that might be cool for some people, but. I'd they, be into the petting zoo. Like know, alpaca. They, what all they want is like tie dye, <laughs> Grateful Dead, reggae. They're looking for all the stereotypical. Well, no, and, and that's why I love like the connection with the URI radio station because it's obviously they have old like Lee Perry type stuff, but they also have kind of like current Jamaican uh, reggae artists where it's like let's bring all those guys in for the two day event. Yeah, I think that's a winner, you know, and and the more you just kind of do that kind of stuff i think um you you develop you start it small and then you just kind of develop a, a following and and who knows how big it could get at what point did you kind of have to make that transition from okay we're doing a party it's getting too big we now have to get permits we now have to have medics on staff we now have to have porta potties like how did that transition go and, and before that how many people came to the first event and like what what were your like when you hit that threshold what were your expectations like oh we're gonna have a hundred friends show up and then like 800 people yeah yeah um so the that, that was kind of the interesting thing about it because it's not what you it's not what you think so 
uh, when we first started doing the events, they were kind of big from the get-go, right? So I didn't throw the events in Colorado, but I know enough about throwing events that I know they just threw a standard concert. There wasn't like any sort of cannabis permit. Nobody said anything about that. They just did it. And they kind of, they, it's one of those ask for forgiveness rather than permission situations. And I think a lot of those events were kind of done in that fashion. And um, our biggest events were relatively quick. Uh, the, the first Secret Cup in uh, LA was pretty big. And I think we had somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people at that one. And then the, the second Secret Cup that we did in LA is the biggest event we ever did as far as number of people. Where, that, where'd, you, where'd you do it? That one was done in the San Fernando Valley at a place called Showbiz Studios. And it was like on, a, it was a studio in a back lot. And so I had a, like a, a full size, like Disney rented this studio. It, it was a full on studio. And, uh, and I, well, I rented all of the studios on the lot. It was like a studio lot. So, I mean, that imagine if you yeah. could do an event on, like, I don't know which studio it is, but, like, that has the Paramount Brady Bunch Sunday. house. <laughs> like, imagine if people are, like, super high, and it's like, holy shit, that's the Brady Bunch house, and I can fucking go in it. <laughs> the little it. house on the prairie farmhouse, <laughs> like, I didn't go, I'm on I, mushrooms. Uh, Paramount did a, a cannabis event once. I didn't go, but... Uh, that's amazing. It, and I know people who did go, but that's the biggest place like that that I know of that did one. I mean, the Playboy Mansion used to do them. Yeah, that, yeah, would, that, were, would, that would also be awesome. Yeah, yeah they kind of got normal started with seed money, so yeah. they've been they into that for a while. Mm -hmm. but there's, there's, some, there's some cool stories about some private -y places that uh, have done some things. But uh, for us, we were we were you know, posting this on Eventbrite, this was public. As much as it was called a secret cup, like it was easily accessible to authorities. And I frequently had to deal with that. What were you saying on Eventbrite? Oh, we, so uh, that story is interesting too. So like I put it basically straight up out there on Eventbrite, <laughs> what it was. So and, no, no map points. And at first it went through <laughs> PayPal and PayPal called me on the phone and I, I was talking to the guy on PayPal and he was talking about stuff. He's like, yeah, there's like details from the event. Right. And he's like, they're selling cannabis at the event. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well we were selling the judges packs on the event. Right. And I'm like, okay, well we'll remove the judges packs. He's like, no, cause you have a dab bar at the event where you're still giving, like he knew this. I was, I was astounded at the detail paypal knew they must have done their research the other thing that was <laughs> it's like when you want to talk to one of these companies you can never get a person on the phone <laughs> right then, like if you had an issue with paypal oh, and you're like up. i need to get in touch with <laughs> yeah, someone yeah, exactly. they would never pick up the phone exactly. and then then they told me exactly how to do the event they're like oh you just change <laughs> it like this eventbrite has no problem with this so as long as it works this way. So they were on your side. You yeah, got a stoner. Pretty cool. Yeah, they you got you got someone you got to honestly stoner. act and like I, a I, consultant from PayPal. Yeah, so I, I did change cool, it, man. and then that, that worked. And so to kind of get back to your other question, the very first time we had to like go with permits and all this stuff was when I did Chalice with Dougie, because um, he had done the Seven Ten Cup in Colorado, right? And it was big. It was bigger than most of the Secret Cups. I, I think it was. What, was he the main producer of that, or was it him and uh, Grassroots, or did they, were they just the place it happened it was at? Him and Grassroots, and the reason he wasn't doing it anymore was because there was. How do I put this? Um, there was a there was a conflict about the amount of work and the quality of the work that Dougie and his crew had put in to the 710 cup and um, and how much that uh, the grassroots crew wanted them to be responsible in the future. 
And so uh, Doug decided to not work with the grassroots crew anymore because of that kind of conflict. And so that's, I was sitting there when he was getting these text messages and he's showing me these text messages and I'm, I'm telling him what I think. And, you know, Doug, if you know, Doug, he's kind of, he might overreact a little and, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it I met him for the first time the other day. He was very nice. <laughs> and yeah, he's very nice. And, uh, and until like there's something and, and he can, he got a little worked up about this and then it was done. And so, uh, and, and I'm sitting right there and he's saying to me, Hey, so if I want to do my own event, do you think we could do our own event? And I'm like, yeah, I throw the Caesar cup myself basically. So i you, you want to do an event? We can. And then he wants to do a big, big, big event. And so the, at, as he wanted to do a bigger event, it became more clear to me that we're not going to be able to just fly under the radar with everything like we were before. So certain things we're going to have to do the right way. And this is going to cost a lot of money. And, um, in Doug's, like he took it on head on and he just kept meeting every obstacle that would come up and, and these money obstacles like kind of kept coming up. And, um, and that first chalice, we, we even hired a production team to like help us do it. And they were not worth the money that we spent on them. And it, it really was counterproductive because we were trying to do things the right way. And we realized that uh, we could do a lot of things ourselves and still do them the right way, quote unquote. Uh, and, and moving forward and, and as we move forward i think we were able to do a lot of things better but doug kept uh he kept raising the bar and so it it was just it was uh, every single event was just nuts we could never really meet that expectation uh there would be certain things we did great and certain things that didn't go so great every time did you kind of find it easier with time and maybe doing events in similar locations? Uh, oh, that's a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. If you do an event in the same location, the second event is colossally easier than the first event. Yeah. No, just, <laughs> get, getting a lay of the land, the first, on like the first rodeo in a venue. I, I yeah. will also say it's less special though, too. Like me doing these events, when you would do an event and it was new and everything was just happening for the first time, that's not recreatable, you know? So, uh, there's, there's a lot of like things that were just, um, just moments. Like it wasn't because we had spent some sort of exceptional amount of money or done anything exceptional. It was just kind of all the people that were there, the time, the place and everything kind of all just coming together. And it was a special moment for everybody. So it's organic. You, you, yeah, you really can't plan those things. They just kind of happen. But a lot of preparation goes into that happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's true. And and um, and and then also just the the randomness of the personalities all coming together, and then they all have like their own agendas and and whatever. Uh, they might, we're all using cannabis. We might also be doing other things and all of that kind of coming together in uh, this really wonderful way. That's why I like doing the camping events. The more we can all stay together for longer periods of time, the better I feel like it is. I like camping events. Yeah. I need to make my way to some. You, you go through the whole range of emotions with people there, especially if it's a rainy weekend at these types of things. You, you hit the whole range. Yeah, that was a part of a lot of the events. We we did events in the rain. I even had, so we didn't do an event, but I did one of Adam's events uh, at Hood Lab in the snow. So I've been through it all. That was a cool spot. Oh, yeah, it really was. He told me he's doing something new 
that's a similar idea, I think. So we'll see. Yeah, so I, I, I remember, so at the grassroots spot, I remember spending most of my time, there was like an upstairs area and we were just like parked on the couches up there. Do you remember that? I only was there, I think, once. And so I, I remember there was like the front area that was like the, the like store. Part yeah. Of it. And then there was like this big back area with like sewing machine. Yeah. And then you, and then there was a staircase in yes. that back. Yeah. And I only was up there for a brief moment. I don't remember it very much at all. You know, I do remember couches. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was very happy dabbing for the like yeah that was a lot of dabbing and the couches were very nice the couches come in handy when you yeah. dab quite a bit. <laughs> I was like thank god for this big comfortable couch underneath me those those places were important parts for like stoner culture and like I, I remember going to a place like that in Canada where like you paid five dollars and you went up and like you, you got to like go into like a little bar area and they would rent you like a dab rig and a torch. They used or, to have those that in down Los on Angeles Hastings too. Yeah. Is that down on Hastings in Vancouver by chance? <laughs> this was in Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Same, but I'm same, sure they the same thing. You know, like there's this version of this kind of place all like all over. Yeah. They used to have those all over Los Angeles, especially in downtown LA. Uh, I can recall a couple of them that I used to go to back in the Prop 215 days. And, uh, you know, you'd pay a couple bucks or whatever. And either, you know, that would get you a dab or that would get you a space at like a rig or whatever. And yeah. uh, it would oh, just dab up. Oh, I remember when uh, it was like the Treehouse. Wasn't that one? Yeah, Treehouse was one. Treehouse. There was um like um, one called like Mr. Nice Guy or something that was like in an alley. And then also funny enough at TLC as well, which I guess turned into Jungle Boys now. Yes, um, yes. That, they um, used to have like a crazy dab bar situation. Uh, the headroom gallery is what eventually also spawned the secret sesh. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, all, like all, some of the people from Secret Cup did that too. That's super cool, man. That's uh, so many events are out, were or like in the past couple of years were out in Adelanto. Oh yeah, yeah. At now the base, <laughs> the base pump. And well, driving out there, I'm just like, they're all like, the same fuck fuck that, like, <laughs> like okay. I don't love those I'm like, I'm driving so far from home just to go to a weed event. This sucks. Yeah, I I agree. My to idea. like a shitty area, you know, it's like fucking like desert. Like oh, I, like you look at real like I looked at real estate in Atalanta. It's like. A I've thousand a dollars like an acre. Out there. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very cheap. <laughs> and that's the yes. That's, the mayor was like all on board. He's very vocal about like, yes, bring all your cannabis stuff here. We need the money. <laughs> <laughs> Our minor league. I, I love. It's like a minor. I want to watch that minor league baseball team play a game. Because <laughs> I guarantee nobody's ever gone to see that team play. They're, they've been to like like. 500 weed events. It's the loneliest mascot in baseball. <laughs> well, that's the other sad thing is that like, unfortunately other places are not welcoming us, you know, like they're like, Oh, you want to smoke? No, you can't come here. Yeah. The like, stigma is still very strong. It's a lot of places. And, uh, it was, it was better before, uh, legalization. I remember high times was able to get into like certain places where I'd be like, wow, this is really amazing that we're able to do this event and in this place. And now, like, there's no way. I, I tried. Well, so so let's, let's talk high times. Sure. What are your thoughts on high times? Uh, so I, I, I have a, a love-hate kind of thing with high times, right? Because I loved going to the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam. And high times magazine was like the place where i learned about all the stoner stuff that i liked about like so it was it was a really great thing and i looked up to all those writers that wrote for them and it was super cool for a long time but the the high times of today has has fired all of the people that i like yes. basically and this is what i wanted to tease out of you all right keep I, going I worked i'm listening for one event and it was with matt stang 
and it didn't go well. And uh, I, I would love to have that platform to do all the things right, because I think they have the ability to do that. But um, they are not. I, I do have, so they're getting a lot of negativity for selling the judges packs. I think that's the way you do it. Your high times, that's the way you do it. Like you're, you're a big public place. If we want to do another event where we don't do it like that, we're also high times. We can do that, you know? So like there's room for all the events if you're a big place like that. And uh, I think the way that they're doing these like city to city events and then you sell the judges kits, that's the way you do it. And I told them that and they didn't do it for years, literally two years before anyone. Uh, and I'm, I guarantee you it was like, hey, I got a good idea. Let's do this, this thing that nobody told us about two years ago, like, you know, to, to Matt Stang, the direct main person. And, and uh, but, you know, it is what it is. And um, I think they have a really, really difficult thing, too, because they did it wrong for so long that people don't want to work with them. And they're kind of like, especially the glass blowers and stuff like that. They're like burned out by high times they just don't see it as like the the place where they need to go and so they have they have a lot of work to do to really include the whole cannabis culture to and represent it properly so um you know there's that i also think that their events were not fixed like ariane won by just giving away free stuff you know so it, it wasn't that you know, there's some weird conspiracy, like maybe once or twice. There was the one time DNA allegedly lost by one vote. I don't know about that, but it also could be true. So who knows? They, they, they were almost kind of, in a sense, a victim of their own success, falling into that formulaic pattern, which is something that you've kind of managed to avoid. And I mean, how would you avoid that in the future? So, well, I mean, we're not doing events anymore. So there's that. Never but, say yeah, never. <laughs> like, absolutely. I, I've said many times, like, the right investor and the right, like, even just the right pitch to me, like, somebody really comes at me and says the right things, like, I could easily be dragged back into this. And uh, are you in LA right now? Where, where's, where's that cabinetry behind you? What? I'm in Big Bear. I live ah. in. So like I make movies. Dude, I actually go I dirt biking up there during the uh, non-summer season. <laughs> yeah, I want to be up in Big Bear. It's good times. Can yeah, I come I hang out sometime? My best yeah, buddy is come on up. Come right. join me. We'll go hiking. Can I, I bring it. kids? <laughs> Can I bring small, cute yeah. humans? Yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. This is that kind of place. But like, to for me to get back to doing the events, it has to be so. Uh, sure, you could throw a bunch of money at me. And for the right amount of money, maybe I would just come do whatever event you want me to do. You know, I'm not like totally not for sale. Like it would be a lot, but it's possible. Um, but if the right person just wanted to do some where I could be creative, where I could do the kind of things that I want to do, or or even just like they can they can grow the event properly. They want to do a big money making event, but they're ready to do it right and grow it the proper way. And, uh, and we can also do in the process of doing this something great for cannabis to give recognition to the people who deserve it, which is not happening. You know, uh, I, I love the Emerald Cup. I think the Emerald Cup does a great thing, but uh, they do a, a very specific thing. And I think that there's plenty of other stuff uh, involving cannabis that they, they are not doing. They're like Northern California the thing they did here where they did this Southern California thing, I don't think it went so great. And uh, I think they should just focus on what they do great, which is that Northern California thing. And they do that great. But uh, this uh, Southern California. Well, I, I, I think part of it, I mean, they, they were, I don't know if it was bought or it's like a partnership where the other side invested a lot of money with, with, with that event. What, what's the event company? It's green street, right? No, uh, no, no, no. Like they were bought by a mainstream event 
company. I'm not, it's not sure. like Live Channel or Live Nation or anything like that. Not Live Nation, a different yeah. one. But uh, so it's kind of like, how do we take this cut? Con- like, oh, they have credibility in the cannabis space. Like, yeah. how do we now like we we need to make them mainstream? So it's right. like, let's do the LA like I get you know, it. red carpet uh, just, yeah. award show and. The, the thing I learned also about doing these events from city to city is that, like, I, I could bring my great cannabis to Spain and I could show it to these guys in Spain. And they're going to be like, we don't like that. Look at this local stuff. This is the real deal stuff. And it doesn't matter if I'm in Spain or if I'm in Massachusetts or if I'm in Seattle or if I'm in Northern California, or if I'm in Southern California, like these are different places. And the, the kind of cannabis that these places like are different. The kind of companies that represent those cultures, those are also different. And you're dealing with entirely different markets for cannabis. And so like the Emerald Cup is Northern California. Like they were extremely lucky to hold on to what they had when they moved as South as they moved from being like really Northern California. To now being in where Santa Rosa, right? And they're great in Santa Rosa, but it it, it was yeah. trippy at that event. Um, it was in Hollywood this year. Well, yeah. no, 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 but but in the fall or yeah, late yeah. fall, it was up in Santa Rosa, yeah, and exactly. the, to, there there was like the that. the <laughs> North Hall, which was kind of like all the outdoor sun grown legacy brands. Mm-hmm. And then the Southern Hall, or I don't know what the other hall is called, but it was like entering a whole new world. It was like you went from like like bales of hay and like jars of weed, <laughs> people in like overalls and like dim lighting. And then the other one was almost like you walked into a, uh, like a laundry mats, like bright lighting. Mm-hmm. And it was all the LA vape brands and like, yeah. everyone's wearing like neon, like <laughs> it, it was, and now I'm sitting, you're like super high and you're like, Whoa, this is like too, it's like too. Yeah. I'm like, I need a more chill place than this. Like and all the bright lights. Of that. Yeah. What's it's- that? I said, you can only do so much of that. I think Emerald Cup can get away with like having like one little thing with all these like weird things. And I like the venue, uh, the, the event promoter, obviously, like these are a bunch of booths that they can sell. Like, of course, they want to sell these booths. But it changes the feeling of your event, right? So then it becomes ethically, okay, well, how much do I want to like create a certain like feeling and a certain kind of theme and a certain kind of event? And then how much do I want to take away from that like by doing these other things, you know? And uh, he's not going to have a bunch of weird music that's, like, totally, like, off. There's there's other things he's not going to do. I think that we also have to be that way about the kind of brands that we're involving in, in these events. And that's what I don't like about High Times is High Times is just a smorgasbord of anything. You have any sort of booth? They'll sell you. A booth. You got some advanced nutrients <laughs> next to, and and it's just <laughs> random. Like the event is just like booth, 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 booth. Like it's all over the place. And if you had ever gone to the Amsterdam events, the Amsterdam events were really cool. And the reason why they were cool was there was the expo, and uh, there was a bunch of booths all at the expo, and a lot of those booths were like coffee shops or they were seed companies and they had stores in the city also. So you could see them at this booth, but that wasn't it. You could also then see their store or go to their multiple coffee shops. And you were also exploring the city to participate in the cannabis cup. So you would, you would go from coffee shop to coffee shop and buy cannabis at each different one. Maybe you would also sit down and smoke a joint at each one. And you got this whole experience that has yet to be recreated in the United States. We have these cannabis cups and it's like a, it's like a, a trade show meets a swap meet meets a concert. Right. And so you're going around, there's all these booths. They just have stuff for sale. A lot of these booths are like, got like megaphones. It's like this crazy thing. 
uh, or you're going to Kush stock or wherever it's the exact same event. None of them are like drastically different. It's like a bunch of booths, a concert, you know, like it's, it's essentially the same thing. And uh, that's, that's a fun event in, in many ways. I'm, like all these girls all dressed up all hoey and like, there's a lot of cool booths and people giving away free stuff. And uh, like, if you are there to buy cannabis, this is the best buying. And like, this is the thing we always hoped in Amsterdam. You couldn't buy weed from these booths at the expo it was illegal. You had to buy weed from the coffee shops. So it was this whole like rigmarole of like, like this whole thing. We wanted to just be able to buy it all at like, the booths right and this is what you can do at the cannabis cup in in uh whatever state that you're going to and that's the coolest thing did, but, did, did you yeah. ever go to the emerald exchange events down here and uh that's the farmer's market right like yeah i i think i went to a couple and and that's cool i like farmer's market theme you know I love those events. I mean, th th those were th those were like the best for me. The best days in California. Even the shitty sessions, it's still the best place to buy. It's better than going to the dispensary for sure. And so many of those shitty little sessions happen, especially in Los Angeles, like weekly, many times yeah. a week. Yeah, all over California. That's how the black market lives. Like the new way to sell weed is to find some little event. And you get a little booth and you sell some weed there. And a lot and of this, style. Th this is why I want to lock down the LA speakeasy style venue. Yeah. I mean, LA, there's so much that's possible. And uh, the event scene is wide open. There's all kinds. Of, I, I think the people that are doing the successful things are people who have kind of, uh, they've made it like a niche thing they've got like a theme they've got like a real good core concept and they're doing it small and then they're growing it from that small thing and they're just sticking to their fan base and they're just what do these guys want let's give them more boom 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 and and they're like they're living in their own worlds you know like to them they're all the secret cup you know they're like everybody likes us and oh it is you know, like as the as the it. target market consumer in LA, what do you want? Me, um, I now, really Otis. enjoy Otis. What up? Um, <laughs> so I I frequent a lot of uh, events. You know, trying to be both a good representative of Future Cannabis Project and also just through my own curiosities as a cannabis consumer. Me personally, I really enjoy the vending from the booth experience. Um, I went to. Um, an event that I wouldn't necessarily use in the, as an example as uh, as an example of the perfect event. I went to the Zolympics the other day just to see if I could find some cool people to talk to or maybe interview uh, after the event. And they had a really strange system where uh, you could interface with a booth to purchase some cannabis through like the recreational system or whatever. But then you would have to you would have to actually go to like a tent on the other side of the event to then wait in line in a queue and then pick it up there. And um, I see how that works as a loophole, but also I, I just wanted to get it at the booth and like talk right. to the guy who grew it while I was getting it and be like, so what do you like the most about this one? And like, what's cool about these genetics? How does it grow? Like what, you know, what makes this special? Because what I went, went and looked for was the organic soil grown stuff that was also, you know, pheno hunted by the grower. Um, for me, that was something called, uh, the company was called Josh Wax. I found a, the one living soil grower at the Za Olympics event. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, what you described is what is the new legal way of doing events in California, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the BCC has basically made it so that uh, you have to have certain licenses to take place on in certain parts of the event. And, mm -hmm. and there are certain booths. So like I know Moxie can do it all. Yeah, Moxie was there. One booth. Moxie has some sort of loophole where they can sell and give you their medicine right there. You know, and I think Moxie actually, funny enough, ran the uh, the dispensary service that yeah. was like handing out different vendors cannabis. So, so it, it it's it's you're supposed to mostly work the way you described, but I do believe there is the possibility of doing it a different way. But you, yeah, 
like exclude a lot. Yeah, I remember at that stadium in Atalanta, I was blown away when they could take people's money and give them product at the booth, and I was like, wait. Like how yeah, how do you yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> to answer your question, uh, to what me, loophole am I missing? Yeah, oh. to answer your question to me, the ideal situation would be like that, where you can just interface yeah. with the booth, and and that's all the the black market events. Th- those are all just like that. You could True go that. to like all kinds of little sesh events, and they just got tables and people with jars, just like the two fifteen days. Yeah, and you know, funny enough, I think the Zolympics was a collaboration with Secret Sesh, who used to throw a lot of those. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. those stashes. but yeah. the secret sesh events that I'm talking about in Adelanto were like legitimate events. They weren't underground events and people were selling at the booths. Right. So I think that there's, there's, um, there's some push to push the limits, right? Like I think early on in the, the earlier days, a lot of those events kind of ran the chance that nothing was going to happen to them. Uh, the secret sesh events that I have been to or heard about lately uh, have ran the way that he just described. That they are clearly trying to follow all the the legal rules because they seem like they want to continue doing legal events. And and I don't think there's a future for that in California. I think that eventually um, you're going to run out of sponsor. Those events are free. Right. So you go to the event free. Um, where is the money coming to throw this event? It's coming from all the vendors that are at this event. And if you're not selling product at these events, I, I wonder how long it's going to take before something else comes along that becomes more worth your while or, or, or something, you know, like, yeah. yeah. Do you think like the enforcement has gotten a little bit more organized and maybe a little bit more well staffed now that it's more of an encouraging factor for these people to do the straight and narrow approach? No, I think that the that uh, what's more likely is that you'll see a secret session event and they're going to just be like, screw the rules, and there's weed on the tables again before they're ready to throw in the towel and be like, we're not doing this anymore. You know, they're just going to go right back to to the sales because that that event in particular, as fun as the event is, it is exclusively about selling stuff at those those tables. Without yeah, it, that, it thrives on no the vendors, event. right? They pay yeah. for the event to happen, essentially, right? Without that, there is no event. So, but but are any of those brands there for long term? Like like if if you're a well funded brand that's in a lot of dispensary or retail shops. I know a lot of brands. You don't even need it. Like, obviously, some brands are like, we're buying a booth and we need to sell more stuff than this booth cost us. But other brands could be like, we're trying to be big and we're just using this as like a a marketing tool for people to buy our Snickers bars the next time they go into a dispensary. Like, we're stizzy, right? Yeah, I think the networking is a big factor. And then, like, moxie are my friends and i've talked to them specifically about this the reason that they do the events uh is not necessarily because they make a lot of money at the booth uh i believe they made more money in the past when it ran a different way but the way that it runs now it's kind of counterproductive to being able to make a ton of money at the booth in sales so they're not doing it for that they're more trying to maintain a presence with the cannabis crowd, quote right. unquote. And, and as long as the people uh, are going to this event and like there's this illusion that this is the cannabis crowd that goes to dispensaries or, or whatever, and maybe it is. Uh, it, the last one I went to, there's, there's a small percentage of us, like the real hardcore cannabis people, but the large majority of the people I saw at these events are casual. You know, so I don't know that that's um, those are the people that are going to be able to survive your company. The, I think the the casual person that buys weed once every couple months, like that's not your guy. That your your guy is me, the guy that needs to buy weed every day. You know? Well, that's like old pals target, right? In the California market, like we sell ounces of of yeah. 
of like reasonably priced weed that's good. Um, I think there's room for it. You know, like the 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 thing that I've seen in California is that black market has exploded ever since legal legal has come in. And <laughs> yes, definitely. Like people now I are vigorously agree with that statement. They're growing weed in their garages again and they're getting enough money from selling it by the ounce or by making hash and selling that or whatever that they're able to do their small operations again. And this is happening a lot. And 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 then you can have a big, like a slightly big operation, go to these sessions and sell and meet a couple people from out of state or whatever, and then ship your stuff. And that's still a thing. And, and I'll also say, and I, I believe we're responsible for this, when you go to the other states, there's a lot of events too. So, you know, if you're a cannabis person and you're like, oh, my my weed company in California isn't going so good. How hard is it to buy a booth in Oklahoma or wherever and then go out there and do an event and then meet a whole bunch of people? And now you've got a whole new business opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people right now are taking notes. Yeah, this is what happened. They're like, holy shit, yeah. I could be doing this. <laughs> this is Drop like, a game for the people. I'm, like mentally, this is something I had to get over. Like I'm not rich, but people would come up to me and they would tell me crazy stuff about things that happen at our events and like businesses they've been able to make and like, like I get nothing from all of this. <laughs> I remember like, someone years ago came up to me and was like you posted a video of me and i've made millions of dollars based on that video and i was like i made nothing <laughs> i was like that's awesome for you i've made nothing <laughs> yeah. That, yeah that's common for me in in my films in general is that uh quite a number of my films have not done like huge numbers financially, but like some of the people in them have got <laughs> really cool things happen to them. So it, sometimes that's that's at least you need semi satisfying. You need <laughs> to figure out reverse royalties. Oh yeah, we well, have to, right. The trickle royalties. that's the trick trickle down. There's uh there's no hope. I just have to be happy for for people yeah. and uh, you, hope someday it comes back around. Yeah, do you Karma think this would be real? Hopefully so. <laughs> do you think there's been attrition uh in not only just like the crowds but the vendors from some of these you know like the high time cups as oh, yeah. people move back more towards the traditional market the booths are turn and burn booths at these events the, the because i have nothing in these events i can be entirely honest that the large majority of these event promoters do not care if you make one dollar back at your booth they're selling you a booth and their goal is to sell more booths this year than they sold last year so that they can eventually sell the booths for more money and then sell even more booths they don't care if you're going to make your money i would go around and i would talk to these booth people and they'd be shocked that anyone wanted to know how they were doing at all because they would do these other events and nobody would talk to them and uh, a lot of times you're getting stuck in bad places and it's, it's really difficult as a booth just coming into an event to make back that booth money and, and then promote your company and be successful that the large majority of them don't do that. And then they quit after like a couple events and then new companies are constantly thinking, I see all these booths at these events. They must all be making money. I'm going to start a company and get a booth. And so it's just why would money. they ever get a booth if they weren't making a ton of money with that booth? Yep. And, and they <laughs> nobody would ever do that. And like, look at all these hot girls that were at this booth. 
and ob- you know it's it's crazy the amount of money that is lost is crazy <laughs> they're making so much money they can hire hot girls to be at their booth <laughs> The, the booth babes, man. I've known a few in my time, and they get paid well. They probably are getting paid more than the person working the booth. Do I'll you guys remember that. the 420 nurses phenomenon? <laughs> I know them well. Yeah. And that I, was like, a crazy I, thing. I, I feel bad for some of them, and, and then I think that uh, it's almost every girl that I know in the cannabis industry was a 420 nurse. <laughs> and so... Yeah, no, no hate. It's just a, it's a crazy phenomenon. It, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy thing. And, yeah right. Uh, uh, they, I like all of them. Like totally. Trent, oh um, no, they're all cool. And, yeah, they're all cool. I like them. It, that. That brings me back to the medical days. I'm in Washington, and you yeah. know when we went legal in Washington, that killed any kind of events. We you can't <laughs> gather, you can't smoke. It, it, it became legal, so you can't do it together anymore. Oh. Yeah, it's very like in yeah. Colorado too. Gosh, absolutely. I, when we I feel like whenever I talk to Brian, like Brian, about doing stuff in Colorado, it's like. You can't do anything anywhere like lots of people in numbers and we well, like this is this is where it goes back to my roots. And uh, uh, thank, thankfully, I still have my old friends that are not part of the cannabis industry that think we're all idiots. And uh, that like I'd say these things to them. And they're like, well, you could just do it the way you always did it before which was totally illegal. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, I guess we could just do that. Like, I guess that's what everyone else is, is kind of doing with these seshes. So, you know, uh, as much as I, I, I complain, you know, what I just I'm not the outlaw that I, I once was. Because you tell me I can't do it in Colorado. Oh, yeah, watch me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah wh- whenever he would talk about that being like like we we're not allowed to i'm like let's just get a <laughs> let's just get a square box space and do something like who, who who's gonna know you're doing it or like by the time they even know you're doing it you're done my friends were like the penalties now are far less than when you were risking it before what are you afraid of like the bcc is gonna come in and be like Hmm. like you know it's not it's not everybody's going to jail like like it used to be <laughs> although that that was trippy up at, at so at the emerald cup with trevor and the whole like oh, wow so it, the bcc and one of the other agencies merge and now it's the dcc the department of cannabis control oh, okay. <laughs> and uh they were like it's like mall cop right like like taking the job super seriously like they were busting everybody (laughs) at that event with vigor for like you have like one ounce of weed on you and you're sharing it with someone like like handcuffs and uh (laughs) it it was I'm like, this is California now. And I think they, I think they got it like embarrassed by the PR side of it. Like, <laughs> cause Trevor's not quiet about these things. Right. And, uh, I don't, I don't, it's like as enforcers, you can interpret things with a, a like wide range of like, I'm either going to be a hard ass or like, Oh yeah. Like, just let the shit go by. And at that event, they were like, we're going to be hard at, like, I mean, besides Trevor, like, I talked to small farms who were, like, I can't, I can't give someone an eighth jar because I'm so scared that, like, the DCC agent is, like... (laughs) Right. The undercover agent is, like, eight feet away and we're gonna, like, lose our license and our family farm (laughs) for giving an eighth away at the Emerald Cup. Yeah, the the problem with the Emerald Cup also is that they're doing these events and they're they're, they're including the the DCC and they're trying to do the right way, you know, 
if you're going to to if you're going to risk it you gotta you gotta plan it from from the get-go that we're going to risk this you know we're going to do this a certain way and and then it becomes a different event you can't do it the same like it's not going to be in the la times or whatever and you know <laughs> yeah, it's not the same event. There's, there's there's no halfway with that but you know what i would love to see and again being a person of like the 90s rave scene i'd love to see map point parties come back yeah exactly those are fun uh I, I suggested that not all that long ago and, and that I thought that this would be a, a really cool way of incorporating the Amsterdam theme uh, of a party because, you know, you would have uh, points that would be locations that you would hope, like, they would be like maybe a coffee shop or a dispensary or, you know, these, these would be not just places where you got a, a map point like we used to do, like it wasn't just a car in a parking lot or something. But now it's also a location that you could maybe spend a little time there, enjoy. It's bringing a little business to that location and then you're moving on and, and seeing the city also. That, that'd be a great way to build independent businesses. You know, if you throw like a coffee shop or a sandwich oh. shop or something along the road, you know, that's a great way for a community to kind of work together. And, and certain communities are very conducive to this. Like, a, like San Francisco has a number of businesses kind of in a small area. I think Colorado has, uh, Denver has some of this, like also. So there's certain places where you could do it, you know. I, I'm still thinking about Chad talking about 90s raves because all my 90s or a lot of my 90s raving experience was in Seattle and Vancouver. That must have been dope. Uh, 90s yes. ravers got me the location for that first Seeker Cup in L.A. in 2013. I nice. lost my venue the week before. It was supposed to be a place called La Casa. It was like a very famous uh, rave location. Big, big building. And uh, it was it was a crazy situation, but I, I met with the people the week before and they were basically like, we don't know about an event. We can't, our lawyer will not allow this event. So I had to like put it all together. So I had to reach out to people from that scene and they had a venue for me. And I got out there, we put it together like days before. What was the venue? So it was called Suede Studios in LA. It was in downtown LA. Um, they, it's, it's the part of downtown where they do lots of parties like this. Uh, it's, it's near the 4th Street Bridge. Um, yeah, to this day, there's a lot of parties still going on in warehouses and uh, some outdoor spots too around there. there. A lot of them are built out. People live in them. Like, like uh, That's an after, after hour scene. I think it'll always be that way for LA. Yeah, I remember the uh, Malibu fire fundraiser I did. Um, uh, fuck, I can't Downtown, uh, it'll come to me. But it was a cool spot. It was huge. And they had a uh, a working kitchen. So, like... I did, so th this was right after the Malibu fires, so I did an event to raise money, and it went from, like, a small idea to, like, it was like, all right, let's have, like, some panel discussions, we'll have, like, that room can be, like, the Masat, like, like, different stuff going on in different areas. Um, and then with the kitchen, it was like, well, let's have like a chef dinner. Okay. Yeah. And so I sourced all the, uh, the food from donations from farmers at farm at LA farmers markets. Nice. So like what there, there was a, a like organic, you know, pork and chicken, like a, a meat company that donated, I think, 70 or 100 pounds of pork. <laughs> wow. And, and, and like, I had, like, lettuce. And it, it was basically, like, here's what I got. And then the chef was like, I'll cook the dinner for everyone. 
Okay. And so I was like, all right, we have all these things. He was like, all right, with that, I'll make a soup. With this, I'll make the entree. Like, and then there was a dessert chef who was like, I'll whip up the dessert. Um, I love it. But that spot was so, like, just the fact that it had a kitchen and you could have, like, a chef dinner. <laughs> yeah. And we had, I like, DJs playing and... The events that are successful, I think, are, are dinners right now, a lot of them. I've seen a lot of those happening in the, in Los Angeles, Northern California, all over the place. Yeah, I think that's one of the popular things. And, like, they've got, like, an email list and they're able to do it to where they grow a following and and uh they sell out most of the ones yeah and i think that's great too and that's that's kind of like value added more so than the event you know there's the whole gathering for the meal you have the actual courses of it too it's there's a lot more presentation or individualism in that versus a large scale event both oh, have their sure. pluses <laughs> Yeah, I think the 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 personal approach to that sort of thing, and then the value of like everyone is getting a certain dinner. It's not necessarily like, well, maybe there is some VIP stuff to it, but it's not like hugely different experiences for each person. It's pretty pretty similar experiences for most of the people, and, and you feel like you got your money's worth because you're getting like this, this, this. You kind of know what you're you're in for. I, so, I I tried so, to do an event like that, but I, I actually was never able to, to have it go forward. I, I did a film a TV show about it. My idea was that I would pair the different flavors of cannabis with different kinds of entrees. Oh, uh, we should we should do. I don't care if it's a TV show, an event, or a mix of the two. We we should do that sometime soon. I'm I love it Be, because I deal with a lot of like farmers and chefs who are like parent like smoke yeah, that's the way that we all enjoy it right like you see all these weed shows on tv and it's always like oh there's five milligrams in the honey and like it's like who fucking eats cannabis like no none of us do this like it's a novelty thing if you're going about like none of us are like hey let's get high let's go bake a, a platform of brownies or nobody does this <laughs> So all of us, the way although we, I have been very high eating brownies, don't sell the all, brownies short. We all do it like this. Hey, let's get high and then go eat some brownies. I've like, seen a lot of really good hash and dinner pairings. So like you have your hash, you can dab with your rig or your flour or whatever. Like yes. Puffco did one the other day, I think, to release their new product or whatever. And that paired with like, um, you know, a half gram or a gram of hash to go with each course is like. Yeah, to me, that's that's much more attractive and impressive than like an infused dish of some sort, even though I'm also into infused dishes for sure. Yeah, I think 100 percent the exact same thing. I'm also willing to be open to flour for people that are like, oh, okay, true that, so true that. Maybe I'm, I'm not that hardcore of a smoker that I can take a bunch of dabs, but I can smoke a joint or something. OK. <laughs> 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 the, to the top row is raising our hands yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm take I, I do yeah. like my flower yeah. 2014 was kind of or, well a little bit before 2014 uh high times was in seattle there is actually everett but we'll we'll call it seattle uh, but that was the first time i've really seen dabs on the mass scale because you couldn't give like people bong tokes but you could give them dabs all day long uh and just the, the energy of the day was kind of funny to watch progress as like I, so i created that also so i had the very first booth at any high times event ever that was giving away dabs to the public like people would come up to the booth and get a dab you did, did it to the thousands you, you did it to the point to where, and I, I even legendary. took a picture of this. Yeah, there there was a you know a sign on the gated area because you know you couldn't see it from yep. the street. Uh, be sure you are sitting down or like wearing a helmet when you're yeah. taking dabs. I'm like the fuck? <laughs> it's got dab helmets. Yeah, it's ruthless. I mean, Peter and I saw somebody uh, you know almost knock out and fall back at the Emerald Cup in Hollywood. It's real. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. We had people pass out at the secret. Well, that dude office. did pass out, right? Like, before dabbing, when I would yeah, go I think to he did pass out. <laughs> in Amsterdam, people would pass out at, at the Cannabis Cup from flour. 
in Amsterdam all the time. I have pictures uh, of them. So, so uh, at Hitman Coffee Shop, I did the last like event there. Okay. And I had no idea that he was like not in a good place and about to shut down. Okay. But uh, I I did an event where I had event producers. So I had uh, uh, Justin from the Emerald Exchange, Justin Calvino, um, uh, Danny, who's doing uh, uh, fuck. What what's like the retail event in L in California? Um, I think I know what you're talking about. I can't. It's huge. What's the What's the biggest event series in California right now? It's Secret Sash. No, it's not the uh, Lemon uh, Haze. Stuff, it was it? it was just in Palm Springs. It's also up in Santa Rosa. Oh, Hall of Flowers. Hall of Flowers. Yeah. <laughs> so D Danny Danny is the guy behind Hall of Flowers. Yeah. So there there are a bunch of event producers there, and Doug. Um, and my oh sorry we're talking about people like getting knocked out from weed yeah, yeah. so i'm producing this event i have like cameras there my brother flew in from the east coast and you i was like all right you work that camera and like 20 minutes into the conversation there's a big thud and everybody's like oh my god like is that guy okay and i'm like Oh fuck, that's my brother. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and my brother just like he smoked a joint and then just like like <laughs> like yeah, fell climbed. backwards and uh in, in Amsterdam oh, no. they have a, a chair sitting outside of like almost every coffee shop. And it's because this is super common for these tourists to come in. They call it a whiteout. And they would get high and then out they would go and then they'd sit him in the chair and be like you're gonna be in fine don't call drink some call. water and yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I got back from uh amsterdam three weeks ago and yeah uh, outside of barney's there was like a couple like younger people in there and me and my wife we we knew it when we saw him going back to the atm we're like oh they're tying it on we were outside yeah they came out boom straight to the concrete just the two friends are looking at him like what do we do yeah but uh and yeah, it happens. Like they don't smoke like we smoke. No. So. Well, I get actually got stopped in one shop. He's like, you know, they were surprised I was American because I was just smoking and smoking and smoking and having a conversation with the owner. And he's like, usually, you know, you Americans take a couple of hits and you're you're done. You're stupid. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's a lot. The large majority of us just are are casuals and. Uh, like the Dutch, they smoke spliffs, right? So it's like tobacco and and uh, or like hash, hash, and, <laughs> and, uh, and that's hash the and shit that fucks me up. Like yeah, I, I lived in France for two Europe. years, and and I, you know, what I always find interesting is when they when they're like, oh my god, you Americans smoke straight flour, and like you can stand up. Yep. And then I'm in France, and I'm like. It's tobacco and hash, and I'm I'm like comatose. Dude, I went to Copenhagen one time on like a multi-place trip in Europe, and like we went to this place, Christiania, that yeah. uh, whatever it's called, that little commune where they have the open yeah, air hash and meat market. That's what it's called. Yeah, Christiania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, man, we got some of the strongest, funkiest, weird mystery hash. Man, just smoked it all over the trip, and it totally just comatose. Especially, you know, if you're enjoying the fine wines and food over there, you know. So, yeah, ha I, I've had combo. I've had the most just like <laughs> knock me on my ass out experiences on hash. Like I, I remember one night being out with a bunch of friends. We're at Buddha Bar, which was like the hottest club in Paris, and uh, this guy Claude Chal was he was the DJ, and like the music just kept like you're eating dinner and you're in like this hot club and you're with your friends and you're having good conversations and like the music keeps building up. Like it's kind of like bop your head, like relaxing music. And then it's like, suddenly it's like two hours later, it's like full on dance music. And the whole time we were eating dinner, 
there was this beautiful girl at the next, like, the next table over, and we kept making eye contact. And then as, like, dinner ended and, like, kind of all the tables got up and started dancing, she came over and we started talking. And she gave me her phone number, which, like, in life never happens. Like, the beautiful girl, like, this is, like, movie scene shit. So I have this girl's phone number in my pocket, and we go, night ends there, and we go back to my friend's place, like, 10 of my friends and we're smoking hash and I just like get paralyzed on the couch where I, I can I'm my mind is completely coherent and like I can hear every conversation I know what everyone's saying but like I couldn't move and my eyes were like in the back of my head and all my friends were, like, all fucked up and talking and, like, then, like, noticing that I'm just, like, comatose on the couch. And then over time, they realized that I could understand what they were saying. And so they were, like, having conversation. And they could, like, see, like, a smile on my face. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the next morning when I woke up, I couldn't find that girl's phone number. So I was, like, knocked out. And, like, the one thing I, I was, like, I would have given up everything that night if I, <laughs> if I did not lose that girl's phone number. Right? Yeah. Oh, I've had man. moments like that on ketamine. But yeah. Not on, uh... <laughs> I think my friends have some similar videos of me like that after smoking hash uh, after a night out in Europe as well. <laughs> did you see a lot of, like, the traditional or just kind of pressed hash? at these events or was it a lot of the newer concentrate rosins or so depending on where i was it was different so like um when you were in the the hot places like colorado or when you're in california you were seeing whatever the hot hash was at that time so if it was shatter it was all shatter if it was you know wax or butter it was all butter if it was like going towards rosin it was a lot of rosin you know, and, and so you were just seeing like kind of that kind of thing from the place to place. Now, when I would go overseas, then it was traditional hash and you would see the people from the UK would come over and they would have shatter and they would have like the regular stuff. There were some people from Spain and from dude, yeah, like I went to Spain to Alma Social Club and they had like feeling frosty hash, which I'd seen in Northern California, like live resin for like you know 120 or 150 euro. And like, also, like, I like, like, talked to one of the dudes who like uh worked there for a bit and like we became buddies and he like plopped his you know five thousand dollar like rhino piece in front of me. He's like, take as many dabs off of this as you want after you know talking to him for like 30 minutes. And I was like, the hospitality here is incredible. It was pretty next level. They they have it, but it's a smaller group. And there is still the group that is the opposite to where people entered Moroccan hash into our event in Amsterdam. And people entered, uh, you know, like solventless, like bag, like, like ice hash in our events in Spain. And so, you know... It wasn't necessarily competitive with the other kinds of hash, but it was still very high quality for what they were entering, you know? So it was cool. Uh, I, I, I felt like um, in some of the situations, the people that were judging didn't know enough about hash. They, they, were just, they just knew how to make the one kind of hash they knew how to make. They didn't really know enough about the other hash to be a, a very conscientious judges on on that and that was a shame yeah it certainly felt like um out in uh certain parts of europe where i've traveled the culture was much farther behind uh california and the united states in general in terms of uh cannabis events and also just the dissemination of higher end products like extracts higher end flowers etc but they are there it's just a lot harder to find them yep yep absolutely like in Amsterdam, I don't know that they have any sort of head shop that sells like high end glass. True. Dude, yeah. my friend and I had such a hard time trying to find a dab rig in Barcelona in like 
it was like 2018. You'd think you'd be able to find one pretty much anywhere. It, but it's like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. After we dropped, you know, 120 euros on a gram of live resin or something, you know, which we're like, okay, fuck, how do we smoke this? <laughs> but, but cannabis, and uh, I remember there was like one glass blower at Spanibus. Yeah, and that was like so, that was so funny for me. I'd like just learned how to blow glass like right before going to that trip, and I was like, "Fuck, I should have made something." Like, <laughs> it's it's coming, but like it is in the infancy stages in a lot of those places. True that. I've seen I've seen some advancements for sure. It's not it's not a common uh, public product at all. That surprised me. You know, two years ago, and even just now, still no concentrates other than maybe some good ice water hash in yeah. uh, uh, you know Amsterdam, which I'm fine with. I you like the, just, the traditional. Uh, you were just there, so how is the rosin situation? Because from what I had heard, they're allowing people to press uh buds at certain coffee shops like with a rosin press and then okay. you do dabs Is, did you see anything like that i okay. didn't see anything like that no we we stayed basically but you weren't looking for it either no i wasn't looking for okay. it either no um yeah, yeah I, mean, the I remember them doing that at prop 215 dispensaries in los angeles well that's yeah. interesting what do you do with the uh like the pucks so so uh, like in, in Amsterdam, there's no uh, hash that's for sale that you can really dab with. So that's holding the whole culture back. Their whole scene is underground entirely. There's also no vape pens or anything like that. So there's like a whole underground scene of vape pens. But if you go to like the head shops that are around in the touristy area, they have dab rigs and stuff like that for sale there. So it's this weird thing where like, okay, you can buy a dab rig legally in this head shop, but you can't buy any oil anywhere real. I mean, maybe you can like, but it's hard. It's not like there's weed everywhere, you know, and Spain, it's a little bit more forgiving, but their, their system is a little bit more difficult too, because you got to be brought into these shops by a person that's already a member. Yeah. They're just very like hidden. I yeah, had to like know. essentially ask a friend to vouch for me to get into that one place that I was talking about. But you know, once I was vouched for, they were very friendly, but it's hard to get in if you don't know somebody Yeah, that really okay. restricts access heavily. And that holds the whole culture back. Right. Totally. So what grew is one here. place that had good extracts in, in Barcelona that I found, I'm sure there's more than one, but as somebody who looked pretty hard, I found one place. Right. So the thing that grew it here was the lawlessness of the sales culture. Uh, unfortunately, that's the truth. Me and my friends were early on dabbing, and it was hard. Like if you were trying to sell oil, like just to your friends, you could do that. But to sell it to these stores, it was extremely difficult. And so you would go to a store and you'd be like, here's what I've made. It's like, this is the price. And they'd be like, we don't want to pay that. And nobody knows what it is. And da, da, da. it was really hard sell for a long time. But eventually it started to become an easier sell. And once the stores would buy it, then that just drove the whole thing forward. So then not just me was making it, then a whole bunch of other people started making it for the stores too. And so you'd have, okay, well, it's this kind and this kind and this kind, and then all these different strains and, and boom, boom, boom. And then it's not only at this one store, now it's at all these different stores and not, it's not only here, it's now in Colorado and now it's, a, and, and it just pushed the whole thing. The stores are what pushed it a hundred percent. So you, you don't think it's, or was it a matter of really the, the consumer being educated or more demand driven or the store owners really saw that like, Hey, you know, this has a better margin than flour, uh, in I a nutshell. Both, I think it's both of those things because at first it was not a better margin. Definitely. It was, they were paying me like more than 50%, right? So the, the industry standard was, okay, I pay you 10 bucks. I sell it for 20 bucks, right? Well, they were paying me 35 bucks a gram for my oil. And then they were selling it for 60. So I was getting a good deal on that situation, right? They were selling it for less. Like I was just getting 
you know, kind of what I should be getting as I had expenses in making it. So we were both kind of making about the same amount. And uh, that dramatically changed as things became uh, like closed loop systems became better and better and like all of it became better. And uh, it was, it, it was definitely the stores, but it was also the culture became like, uh, they would have these little bars and these little smoking areas. And, and then we would go to events and we would be dabbing, you know, and we would dab people out and people would smoke weed and there's that, but it wasn't the hot thing. Like we were the hot thing. You would come to an event and like even high times. I remember we would just set up our tables. I remember teaching people how to do the dabbing thing at their booths. Dougie was doing his whole thing at his booths. And it was like, it was the hot thing to, to do that. And so it, it's kind of how a lot of cannabis is just hype. And so part of it was the hype. Part of it was that you could now go into a store and buy this and it was regularly available, whereas it was not available and not popular for a long time before it was called dabbing even, you know, we just sold them oil and they didn't, you know, there was no, this dabbing thing wasn't what it was called. It was just smoking oil or whatever. Well, you've, you've kind of been able to be, you know, ahead of it just through your experience and the position that you've been in. What, what do you kind of maybe see is the next thing for the future? What, what is the next hype? Huh. Is it, is it a flower? Is it an oil method of smoking? What, what do you see coming there? Yeah, I've, I've been watching. I mean, I, I see like the trends that uh, have become popular and there hasn't been a lot that is impressive to me. Most of the things that I see, I think are, are actually steps backwards. So uh, to me, the best oils are um, a, a very well done hash rosin, I still think is uh, excellent. And that is, I believe, the most popular thing right now. But I think the large majority of rosin is very average, and I would rather have it as BHO probably. And I think BHO um, is the best oil for the large majority. Like it, it, it's easier to do as a, a hash maker. It's almost a no brainer. So for the large majority of hash, your end product would be better if it were made as a BHO rather than you making it as a rosin. You can make very good. Rosin, it's, it's great, but it's not at the level where I need it to be to pay these outrageous prices. I would rather just pay less and have a, a higher terpene profile in a BHO thing. But, but um, uh, so that's what I think about hash, basically. I don't like the, the terpene. I, I don't like the separation. I don't like diamonds. I don't like the sauce. I don't like any of that. I want it to be all full spectrum, like a, a normal butter, wax, that kind of thing, or a shatter type consistency or like a, a, just something that comes all from the plant, not adding anything to it or, you know, I, I, I don't mind CRC. I don't mind that. I think that uh, when that is done properly, it results in a finer product. And... Um, all of that is, is, is great. And, and I also like old traditional hashes. And I think some of that is, is wonderful. But as far as like trends, I don't, like the, the, the Puffco thing like that, that's very convenient. I think that is a step down as far as like the quality of the dab that I'm getting from those tools. So I'm not very impressed with that. The Terp Slurpers and all the, the, the bead sets, uh, that is extraordinarily effective. Like when you go to take a small dab, when you've got like one of those slurper sets, you are getting a huge amount of smoke. From yeah, those are off amount of oil. So I respect that. You know, it's a lot of work taking care of that. And I saw the jar, and like you know, there's dedication to that. Yeah, I like have a bunch of little marbles I made too, like on my torch that like fit the various sizes. And I've given a lot of them away to various like growers and glass blowers. Like all of that works, and and I I see that trend, and I see the bangers kind of changing a little bit here and there. I, yeah, like I was taking some I was taking some dabs earlier on the stream just on my standard banger because of just the ease of use, but the terp slurper is superior for the experience. Like I've I, taken probably three terp slurper dabs today, and those were all I needed versus you know 
I've taken three to four just within the last hour and a half on the normal banger. Yeah. I almost exclusively use a normal banger like that. And I have yeah, very easy. started to put a couple marbles in it, whereas I was very resistant yeah, yeah. for a while. But I, I see all the various, like there, there was like that puke and beagle one for a while. Oh yeah, the thermal insulated. Yeah, there's, there's all these yeah. different ones and they've had their little moments where they were like totally. really cool. And and I just see like evolution of those tools. That seems to be kind of the direction it's going is, is more evolution of quartz tools and maybe more incorporating that kind of thing. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody eventually figures out how to cool down the smoke before you're inhaling it. That would be I pretty cool. That was something when I was vaporizing that I was trying to master and we felt like we got like some really cool tools for doing that. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if something like that kind of came in, but the the other side seems to be that like there's all these there's all these products, like just like very engineered products. And it wouldn't surprise me if like one of these products becomes like really, really hot. Like like some sort of like like a rosé for cannabis and and otis it's not going to be the next one you review (laughs) (laughs) it's an inside joke (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's powerful and and that marketing is what i would say is the next trend in cannabis and i i'd really like to see some products that were um worth the achievements that that are going to be made, but I, I think that probably marketing is going to rule the game for a while. There's there's a lot of selling a lifestyle and not necessarily substance, but substance will come after saturation and more education and more underground events like Shad's holding through. out hope that that will be true. I am holding out hope, man. I am holding out hope. <laughs> well, I, like I said before, I think that the coolest thing about the world we live in is that you can you can have a niche concept you can build a following and you can feed that following and you can survive and live a happy life just doing that thing for your people it's you know i, I was earlier reminded about you know because i've skateboarded all my life too is when nike got into skateboarding i mean nike was you know the jocks your whole life the jocks always tried to beat up the skaters and you know it wasn't welcome and there's this so you know, nike is your cookies or cookie oh, cookies fuck, is your man. nike pretty much and then there was this guy uh chet thomas or chet childress just like a fucking, I sleep in the bottom of the pool at the skate parks because I don't want to buy a hotel room kind of guy. Uh, he got sponsored by Nike and he's like, hey man, don't hate on me for making a living just because now I can actually make a living at it. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, it changed my perspective a little bit. It's like, there's a lot of people who really dedicated their life to this plant and and haven't seen too much from it. Uh, but now there's some people maybe able to get a payday and as long as they can keep their integrity uh i'm all for it yep the the dog town and z boys and all that they're never gonna get what they deserve but tony hawk has like seven video games (laughs) well (laughs) said well said so like in in the grand scheme of things cannabis is going to be that way too and and i have my little like bitter moments where i'm like oh really this is the person that you guys think is great and they have no achievements you know they haven't done any like they haven't risked their life they're like they've got a lot of followers on TikTok or wherever and you know like this is what's important in in today's age and and i have to chad's kind of, huge on TikTok, by the way that's, that's, <laughs> that's, i don't even have an account man i don't even know how to work it <laughs> you know it, it is what it is and and uh like I know plenty of people who, uh, you know, they had what they had and, and ma- yeah, maybe they're never going to get that recognition that they should have got, but, um, you know, you can never be bitter. You just got to appreciate what you have and, uh, not take, don't, don't compare yourself to other people. Just appreciate the good things that you've got and move forward and just always try to progress and be a positive person and celebrate these other people. And, you know, you never know where it might turn. 
I, uh, I I noticed just here uh, since since we got on skateboarding, another thing that I love is MMA. During the whole video, I I noticed you had the pride shirt on. Right now, I'm noticing yeah, yeah. you have the tap out shirt on. So so when are you and Nick Diaz getting together for an <laughs> event, man? When when you and the Diaz boys getting together I'm to do a cannabis sure related with him? Um, uh, so I I have a a history of. Uh, when I was originally writing, before I wrote for a magazine, I wrote for MMA websites. And I was like a hardcore MMA fan from like UFC 2 all the way on. And then it like went dark for a while. I lost track of it for a while. And then I had a, a friend come into my life who, who trained. He did jujitsu and stuff. It brought me all the way back. And so I trained at 10th Planet. Eddie Bravo was my jiu-jitsu teacher. Uh, Joe Rogan was in my class. And so, like, I have um, a little bit of a, a history of, of MMA stuff. And I was doing a lot of stuff in MMA when I was doing cannabis, too. And I had, like, a, a crossroads moment where I went the cannabis way instead of the MMA way. But uh, it's still deep to my heart. And I follow it pretty closely. And I, like you noticed, I, I'm, I'm a pride fan. I'm now currently, I'm like a, a glory fan. I'm a fan of one FC. I like BKFC. Like you, I, I like you've BKFC. got the fight pass. You've got the fight pass subscription. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm deep. And, That's and awesome. I, I like the obscure organizations uh, a lot. I, I you like the just, phone booth fights then. Yeah. I was okay. just going to try to call in Kenny Florian. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Like, he played soccer. I used to play soccer. You know, I so I I grew up with him. So we oh, played we, we we played. Uh, we used to sleep over each other's houses every Saturday night, and we're on like the same the Dover Sherburn soccer team. That's cool. And then and then like years later, I'm like, I don't know how I like. It must have been watching something on YouTube where I realized he was like a huge MMA fighter. <laughs> that's so funny. And I was like, holy fuck, that's Kenny. And it, it made sense because when we were little, like he has two older brothers and they used to, they used to be super into martial arts. Like they had like nunchucks, throwing stars. They were into like <laughs> Wing Chun, Jiu Jitsu, uh, karate. And they used to make me and Kenny fight each other. How fun. <laughs> but, but like, the, the oh. family was into that. Like, <laughs> so then, like, you don't see the, because we went separate ways. Oh, yeah. You don't see this person for 20 years, and, like, you're like, holy shit, he's an MMA fighter. Like, another guy who was also on our same t soccer team I randomly, I was living in New York and I went into Kim's video uh, and I was like, I want to get a DVD and randomly I bought a DVD because it was, it was this band Dispatch and their last con concert in, uh, what is it, like Newbury Common or like somewhere in Boston where I was like, holy sh like I grew up in Boston so that, that's what I recognized. So I had no idea who this band was and I brought the DVD home and I watched it and they're playing their last concert in front of 100,000 people in Boston and I'm like, holy shit, the lead singer is Chad Ermston who is also on that same soccer team with Kenny Florian. How funny. Uh, and, and those are like the two dudes who like are from my nursery school to sixth grade life <laughs> who randomly i'm like holy shit like he's an mma fighter and he's like a famous musician um robin thick was on my on my, soccer, <laughs> you know? my dad used to take him home from practice yeah it's a it's a small world Little League sports. My sister's kids are on <laughs> this famous person's on their team and that you know it's crazy. True that. It's cool to hear the MMA connect too. I did like Kempo Jiu Jitsu, Tong Sudo, Muay Thai, American boxing for years. Uh, so I feel the vibe for sure. That's nice. Dope. 
Nice. Yeah, and then also one of my uh, best buddies as of the last like ten years is uh, Khabib's cousin. So like oh, he nice. always goes and sees his fights when he's in America. <laughs> right on. Now, I did some training with some other people. By the way, don't be scared by Chad's um, mannequins. <laughs> he's a mannequin. Oh. I got Hoarder. Bob back there. Took the shirt off. <laughs> he hoards mannequins, <laughs> but exclu- exclusively male mannequins. Uh, Chad got a great shot there. It's like all blurred out. He must have a good camera. <laughs> uh oh! Now he's halfway there. Oh, <laughs> tends to scare people in chat. They have they have a lot of fun together. Should have seen me when I was selling my last house. Oh my god! The realtor told me to put it in the garage. <laughs> tie dye, Chad. You know about like tie dye at all? Not making them. No. Oh, this I went to a crazy tie dye shirt. Is that a Saint Bernard, or do you have a Saint Bernard's uh, tie dye? No, this is a. Uh... Okay. Looks well, that's like sick. It's my buddy from Oakland. It's actually, a guy who I DJed with and did a lot of weed stuff with for many, many, many years. So I just worked on filming a documentary about this tie dye competition that went on at oh, DFO wow. and I got like put on game about tie dye. And there's this huge movement that reminds me of the secret cup going on in tie dye where like they're all starting to share their techniques. And so now they're creating these new designs and like young people are like creating designs and they're like selling these shirts for crazy money. Dude, yeah. I went to a tie-dye show at Lifted Veil Gallery in downtown LA the other day, which is like a high-end, heady gallery. Nice. And, um, you know, there were shirts from ni- 900 to, you know, 2K. Yep. And amazing tie-dyes from guys in Japan and, like, guys from, you know, other parts of the U.S., California, all One over. One guys was from the, sh- the competition. He was going to that event. It was a great show. It was yeah. so cool. It was, it was wonderful to see all those shirts. Mm-hmm. There's a guy uh, who's, who's a frequent listener to the channel, uh, St. Bernard's Observation Booth. He makes some of the wildest tie-dyes I've seen. He sent, oh, God, I wish I had Well, I was going to say, here. don't you have one of them? I do. Like, this was my old logo, like the Twin Peaks kind of owl. And he managed to That's do sick. a tie-dye. And the, the owl is perfectly, like, right on the That's chest cool. in the middle of all the madness going on. I'm like, how the fuck did you do that? Dude, <laughs> watching these guys do it, they're, like, twisting these things up it looks like nothing and they're like it's amazing i've tried it so i can definitely appreciate what they're doing (laughs) i i got like yeah i'm not a pro (laughs) yes we do all kinds of different movies and so one of my new movies is going to be about that it's gonna we're gonna wrap it probably in about a week or so and then in a few months it'll be released and we'll see what i can't wait to see that that's yes so sick I would love to see that. Definitely let us know here. <laughs> but so is that what you're mostly focused on now is kind of documentaries and. Yeah. Like, so I, I really like film and um, I do I'm, too. I've been working on a narrative project and I'm, I might try to do some of those, but those are a lot of work, like, like writing a script. It, it's a lot of planning, like doing documentaries for me is, is not uh, a ton of work. I do a small amount of research on the person before I go out there, but not a terrible too much because I want a genuine conversation. And so uh, it's, a lot of it is just like me setting up all the equipment, filming and scheduling the interviews, and then just kind of collecting a few interviews. And then I send all those on to my partner and he really has the hard part. He edits and then uh, does all the posts on all the and projects. And so who is this? That's my partner. His name is Jason. And uh, he, well, he's out here right now, but he was living in Georgia for a while. So we were that, sending that's, it back and forth. That's definitely a two person job, though, because if you didn't have kind of the foresight to know how it was going to look in the end, your jumble of stuff to him would be all over. But I think yeah. with your experience, you already see how it's going to be. So you sequentially are kind of laying things out. Yeah, like I, the tie dye competition was a great way of explaining it because before these guys go to make all their tie dye, they make colors, right? So they're mixing this and that. And they've got like a series of maybe like 20 colors. And then they make their shirt, right? So I make the colors. I 
collect all these interviews. I kind of get the storyline, the theme of what we're going to do. Here's, here's all the idea. And then my partner, he paints the picture. He puts it all together, he kind of like sees it as it's coming along. He moves things around and then he makes the final product at the end. And, and he has far more experience than me. He was professionally was editing for Fox. Like I'm very, very fortunate to be working with him and, and I'm just creative and um, outgoing. You know, Filmmaking is like, a team effort. Yeah. So, like together, we, <laughs> we make it work. Otis, you need to to step up your technical chops, and we can do great things together. <laughs> oh yeah, let's do it, dude. I'm ready. <laughs> uh, my day job is uh, DIT and assistant editing for like uh, documentaries for like HBO, uh, Netflix, Amazon through like wow. a production company based in Brooklyn. But uh, I'm ready to. I'm ready to take a lot of that energy and put it towards the future cannabis project stuff. I need those connects. I need that Netflix phone number. <laughs> Sick, go. dude. Yeah, well, let's let's all connect on that stuff. Yeah, it's- no, we need we we all need we need the scheme because like I have a bunch of like Netflix and like all, all the streaming services that are spending money on stuff <laughs> yeah, <there's- laughs> they're like we'll overpay for anything right now. Yeah, we it's like produce- holy shit, we like the show. <laughs> We have an idea. Just between just between give all give him the us, hair. Give, give him the hair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just be like, it, look at it's this. a on. stoner who's a pert plus model. So, like, <laughs> you can see also with the Seeker Cup is we did a lot of that kind of stuff where we took sponsorships and we were able to include things in the film in addition to like credits at the end of the film. Mm-hmm. So there were a variety of ways that people were able to pay to kind of be a part of it, and it wasn't like messed up that we were able to kind of include them in the film crowdsourcing and, funding for a film yeah. or like even including people for these various roles too like it's it's a great way to do it when you don't have like a major backer because everybody can't get like you know shitload of money from like yeah. one entity the other side also is that we use a distributor right so if we have a project that hits our distributor is able to get it on various different Oh, excuse me, various different platforms. And we're able to make money from each of those platforms as it happens. Like, so for example, um, we just did this YouTube thing, but like I gave it to you and it's not a financial thing. We're just trying to, <laughs> you, right? we, we made um, zero to zero dollars on that right. initiative. So some of the <laughs> other films that I collectively, made, we made zero dollars. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, so some of the other films that we've made, have been uh, picked up by YouTube channels like years after I already put them out. And then we made money with those channels because they had like a huge following. So that's also a possibility if you're doing something that's cannabis themed, it's it's a cannabis you know thing. But if you're doing other themed projects that could cross over, then they could also be uh, in all, of, all these other places you know true that Uh, yeah so like when you saw like action bronson did this like ancient aliens but it's him like smoking weed with like that's why he had the crossover of that because the aliens thing is a huge draw way bigger than cannabis so (laughs) wait (laughs) explain this aliens thing to me yeah like the movies that i make that make the most money are the weird stuff i call it like everybody's super into aliens i'll tell you so for example when i go to a cannabis event and i see a bunch of people and they're like hey you're making movies now and they say to me i've seen one of your movies and what do i think i'm like oh well maybe they've seen the secret cup or maybe they've seen cannabis versus cancer or about cannabis and cancer or cannabis in your doctor or anything like maybe one of my psychedelic movies. No, always. <laughs> it's your always, Scientology documentary. <laughs> it's, it's always this Bigfoot documentary that we made, and like millions of people have That's seen tight. the Bigfoot documentary. <laughs> That's super tight. Crazy. 
Um, Otis, have you watched that one? I didn't even no, know. No, I got I got. I, I want to watch this well, now. Yeah, I gotta work. watch it too. Being in okay. the Pacific Northwest, I gotta watch it. I have oh, no yeah. idea why it hit so hard, <laughs> but it hit really hard. And we have the a people have spoken. We have a couple other ones about some other topics, but it's almost always strange. The strange totally. phenomenon just sure. crushes. Cannabis is like like a like a match. And like the strange phenomenon is like a brush fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's too mainstream now. No, it's crazy how big those things are. And so like that's why a, a few of my projects after this tie dye thing are like strange. I have I have a dog man project that I'm working on. I have like a Mufon. Project. Can you just can you define what a dog, dog man, man is? <laughs> dog man is kind of like werewolf, but it's also kind of like like a, a bigfoot with a dog face instead of like a big whoa one. sick <laughs> i don't know how much i believe it but people say they see these things and like i love the werewolf I, like that's classic horror. this is like an obscure yeah. dc or marvel character could be yeah they want to the like side the, the skinwalker legends <laughs> yeah it's, it's something like that yeah exactly the dog man has been seen at the skinwalker ranch definitely so there's there's all these like stories like that about this, and uh, so I'm just kind of like. But you're mad. doing a documentary on that. We're doing a documentary on that, yeah. Because just like you asked me about it, other people are like, "What the hell is that?" And so we're just gonna dive deep into it. So because I wasn't listening, <laughs> what what exactly is it? It's a per it's a person who what? So it it's basically a cryptid, right? So like some sort of an animal of the forest that is unknown. Uh, some people might say it is part human and part dog, right? It's basically the body of a human or a, a Bigfoot or essentially like an ape type of a body and the face of a dog. And these descriptions but, vary, you know. But are you, are you interviewing people who have seen this? Um, I think one of the people did see it. It's been a while since I've done all the interviews, but I, I interviewed about th three or four people for it. Yeah. And Over the course of a year, it took me a dope. long time to get people to talk to me about this. Where are, the, where, where are these people? Uh, a variety of places, you know, like these are not the most credible of like, I'm not talking to scientists about this. You know, these are people who have like, but like, like in specific U S like in different U S states or yeah, they're all from the United States. And oh yeah. The US states. Yeah. Mostly but, rural places like, um, maybe Colorado, but like that kind of a place. Regardless, they're all genuinely. Yeah. They're all true genuine people. about what yeah. they're telling you. Yeah. yeah, they're all true believers, and like uh, I'm asking kind of from a skeptical point of view, and from a novice like point of view, where I'm like, so is Dogman the same thing as a werewolf, and why is it the same, and why is it not the same? And like they're gonna explain it to me from their different perspectives, and, and like you know, why should I believe that there's Dogman? And I'm, I'm when you see the Bigfoot documentary, I think the reason why people like the Bigfoot thing is because I'm just very serious about it. And I'm not like, you guys are all idiots. I'm like, here's why they say there's no Bigfoot. What do you got to say about that? And then like, they're telling me oh, why. And then I ask them other stuff where I know they're going to want to hit a home run. Like, oh, is there any historical evidence of Bigfoot? And then they're like, well, there is a shit ton. And the, you know, like, like all you that. You set thing. them up for success. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the dog man is essentially the same kind of thing. I give them some, some, you know, softball pitches. And then some of them are like, this seems like nonsense, you know, like convince me. So there's that. The, I, I don't necessarily believe in dog man, but the UFO one I believe more in. So when I'm talking to the UFO guys, I'm more of a, I'm one of them to a certain degree where I really want to know what this is I'm very skeptical about a lot of it, but you could convince me of, of some of this stuff too, because I want to believe it. So you're open-minded. Yeah. Yeah. That, almost to the point where I have to be skeptical of myself because I think I'm too open-minded. <laughs> it's a lot we don't know. 
Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting. And like, I the thing I'm doing is talking to these investigators, right? So these are the guys like, you see a UFO, you call somebody, and they go out and they investigate it. So it's really interesting to, to hear what they're seeing and like, you know, obviously a lot of it they're disproving. And are they, they with a specific agency? They're from a, a organization called MUFON. It's the Mutual UFO Network. So it is basically. It's like a publicly funded organization. Um, like they're they're funded by themselves and like sponsors, and it's not from the government. For example, this is a private organization, and it's made of like people who are like volunteers, and then all the way to people who have like more responsibility and like official roles. But that like when you call in, like there's a protocol on okay this is worth investigating where we send somebody to the actual place and they look and they talk and they actually investigate to where it's like, okay, we just note this down. This is something we can't really investigate or whatever. You know? My and, and dad it, has like creature stories about seeing creatures in Joshua tree. And then I go out and spend a lot of time out in like the 29 palms, wonder Valley area, mm -hmm. like in the deep wilderness where my friends set up like a ranch and it's crazy vibes out there, especially when you take a bunch of psychedelics too, I man. I can only imagine. Yeah, <laughs> it's do you, really intense. Do you see the predator? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the woods exactly, are... Man. The you woods run are off into the darkness. <laughs> you you hear all like, sorts of things at night. I, I think there's a, there's a possibility for anything, and I'm just very open-minded with all of that kind of stuff. And... Uh, I, I've never personally seen anything that like made me a true believer to where I'm like, I know for sure this is all real, but talking to those people, um, it's really interesting. You know, they're very convinced. We used to have raccoons that got in our, uh, <laughs> garbage growing up <laughs> and I could totally see someone being like, it's a fucking alien. <laughs> <laughs> Something is rattling around the garbage can. Well, that's part of the cool thing with the investigators too, is that um, they know how ridiculous this is. <laughs> and they are mostly dealing with people who are mistaken about what they've seen. And they're mostly debunking these things. And so when you're talking to them, they're very honest about the large majority of the things are this. And they can give you all these stories about, look, this guy thought it was this. I was able to show them that and we were able to prove that it wasn't that. And then many of these people don't want to hear it from them where they're like, look, it's not really a UFO. And they're like, oh, you're obviously a, 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 a funnel for the government. You're just telling me like, some sort of, you know, the, the, the conspiracy is thick with, with a lot of these people. And so when they're telling me also though, like I've investigated this other thing and it wasn't explainable and here's all the reasons why. That's that's compelling, you know. Definitely, I saw there was a, a question here in chat. Um, we could definitely stay on this one here too, but uh, it was, says, "What was next for you?" All right, let me make it a little bit bigger. What's next, cannabis related? <laughs> oh, okay. Jeremy's play. So I have a couple projects I haven't started filming that I would like to do. Um, and then I've started a glass documentary that's like barely started that um, I would like to kind of tell the story. It's like glass blowing and like some of the niche um, pipe related parts of glass blowing. Do you do you know Paul Troutman? If if you uh, if you need, I can connect you to him. I don't think I know him. Paul's cool. The guy, he started North Star and sold it to Abe and then started Trapman Art Glass. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah so I know Abe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're both super cool, man. Uh, Abe and Paul are some legends, but Paul actually taught me how to blow glass up That's in awesome. Portland when I was living up there. But yeah, I'll connect you to Paul for sure. He'd be a great guy to talk to. Right on. Because so, he actually, he started North Star and then sold it to Abe. Yeah. North Star is one of the main uh, parts to that story. They created all these different colors and they've been a, a pushing driving factor in the pipe industry, right? So mm -hmm. that's a big part of the story. Um, yeah. I want to also tell uh, a story that you kind of got a little taste of uh, in the secret cup. So we know 
um, Evil, the person who made the Dabachinos. And uh, I, I ran into him at an event and I told him, hey, I'd like to tell your story about getting sued by Starbucks and the whole thing. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And so uh, that's going to be really interesting. Yeah, I'm excited soon, to hear about that. Yeah. As soon as I get a little bit of stuff cleared off my plate, like some of these strange phenomenon ones done so that I can get some money, then I'm going to go back and uh, do that one. And uh, hopefully that hits. Like uh, I'm, I'm really hoping the cannabis community starts responding more to these projects because the reason you don't see more cannabis content out there is because, uh, it just doesn't get the attention that a lot of this other stuff does. And so the more that we can like view each other's stuff and all like, um, you know, cooperate and collaborate together and grow this stuff, the more content and the better the content will be. True that. True yeah. that. We need more weeds, like mainstream. So all the people watching right now should speak up. <laughs> and demand this content yeah, from, yeah, yeah, from, from right. their local subscription from Share netflix it. from amazon from wherever yeah, yes yeah. we're ready to provide it we've got the people we've got the you know best people in the world to provide the content netflix damn it <laughs> you don't have enough weed content <laughs> true that call true me that. <laughs> you have too many korean period piece <laughs> documentaries <laughs> yeah. we, not we enough weed right. content hey man they, they did add night rider so i'm kind of content <laughs> with that right now <laughs> like the 80s tv show version oh yeah yeah the yeah. whole oh wow oh yeah don't hassle Ooh. the hoff yeah <laughs> you can go to imdb and rate movies on imdb that's how they, they know if you like them or not like including my movies so go there and like rate them leave reviews that gets us more attention from these platforms and then they'll give us more of a, a place to show all of our stuff. What are some of the, uh, like current, current events that you respect? Hmm. Okay. That's a good question. Well, I, I mean, I love the Emerald cup. And I do think that that's probably the premier event right now. Uh, I haven't been to the High Times events in a while, but I would imagine the High Times events are pretty much the same as they used to be. And those are fun events. Our friends are doing some events on the East Coast that are really cool. So uh, the community bonfire events, uh, we mentioned them in the uh, Secret Cup film, and our friend Brett Whaley does those. Those are really great events. I recommend people go into those. Uh, the the Oktoberfest or Croptoberfest event by Mike Clinton. That's a great event, and uh, I went to that to screen the the Secret Cup uh, last year or maybe it was two years ago. Can't remember now. Um, and you know, honestly, there's something of value to all the events, and you you'll know if it's the event for you if you go there. And you give it a try. I say give them all a try. And if it feels shady and it's not your kind of scene, then maybe you should go to like one of the camping events or uh, some other kind of event that's more like your type of thing. If all you're trying to do is buy product, like pretty much all the events are going to be good for that. Yeah, I wonder I wonder if the motivation has changed post legalization for a lot of the attendees. Yeah, I'm I don't sure. think they, they don't know what it was like where the, like we couldn't get together and we were like really wanting to like smoke weed and like party and like have a community. Like they seem like they just kind of take it all for granted like they expect the events to really give a lot to them. They don't like they're not like appreciative that they're even able to get together. Like it's, it's a whole different thing. And you know, it yeah. is what it is. Well, one thing I, I always kind of point to like the, you know, the newer, the dispensary culture is missing is, you know, I always say it's that, that experience of the dealer's couch, 
You know, yeah. it's like you always had to like hang out for 20, 30 minutes. You'd always meet somebody from the next school over. And, you know, that's how you met people. That's how you network. That's how you learned about new music. It's like that's you don't how the get coffee that. shop experiences, too. And, and yeah, we just lost yeah, everything. Yeah. There's no record stores anymore. There's no even the head shop is less of a hangout place than it used to be. You know, like a, a lot of the people that are going to the head shops now are just kind of they don't know anything, you know. Whereas it used to be like that was the only place you could get these really nice glass pieces and things like that. And I mean, the world has changed. It's uh, there's cool other stuff like some of these glass blowers doing their little private events and there's cool stuff, you know. But I, I miss I miss the old ways too. And and I think that part of our culture, what it's missing is is those those moments where we're all forced to be together and then we have to kind of compromise and make make it work. We all have to get along and there's all these different personalities, but we're able to make it work. And uh, there's too much individualism to where you're getting like this cookie cutter, specialized, perfect thing for you experience. And you don't even have to deal with these other people. I I think that's not very helpful. Like we're missing that like community, that whole coming together and, you know, making the best of it, even though it's not, you know yeah. what we really want make the best miss miss the struggle the struggle was yeah. the struggle was real <laughs> the journey like what they yes. say always is the journey is the, the good part the goal a lot of times is not as gratifying i've found that to be true with most of these things that i've experienced also I want to uh, just give everybody in chat too the option. If you guys have any questions uh, or want to hear any topics, let us know in chat because uh, hopefully you guys caught the movie beforehand. If not, go back and watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, they're like, what, who are these random people talking right now and what are they talking about? <laughs> yeah, like for me, as, as far as like the secret cup living on, I'm happy to tell anybody that wants to throw their own secret cups exactly how we did them. I'll tell you exactly how to do the the judges packs and all of that stuff. I, I would love to be invited, but I want other people to go on and do them. I'm not like holding the event for ransom, waiting for some investor to give me money so that I can go do anybody can go throw a secret cup. Or if you just want to know how, like I, I did those things or our advice towards. Well, so how, how do you approach the judges packs? Well, it depends what you're trying to do. So for Chalice, we did a different scenario than we did for Seeker Cup. But for Seeker I remember Cup, the Chalice stuff. Chalice is where you make money. So if you want to know how to make money with judges kits, that's how. Uh, the way that you did it for the Seeker Cup was how to have an authentic champion, right? So uh, your integrity is, is far greater when you're doing it the way we were doing it for the secret cup because we're not selling the judges kits at all okay so the way we would have it is it was basically it was, it was tiered towards um i could have 40 competitors and we were going to have 50 judges kits total so uh i forget the total amount that you were required i think it was 20 grams but we would gram out uh, and, and eventually I had the people gram it out for me so that I didn't have to do this because it was a colossal amount of work. But you would have point threes. You would have uh, 50.3s, right? And so you would come to the Seeker Cup. You would have, um, a, a, I think it was like uh, three two-gram jars and then 50.3s, something, something like that. And... Um, that was your entry. And the, the two gram jars were for uh, testing. So I would give uh, two gram samples to the, the lab and they would test each sample. And then we would have the dab bar that would get a two gram sample. And then a lot of times I'd have to give the dab bar a refresh of, of that two gram sample because people went through it and dabbed all of it, especially at the end of the event. So that was how we covered all the oil. And then the 50 grams, we would get each one, and then we'd have like an assembly line, and we would have all the judges' kits, and each person would put each number into the thing. So you'd get all these things, you put like these little stickers, it'd be like one, two, three, four, five, just 
randomly numbered. Everybody had the same style of jar that we told them you bought the jar from this place, but nobody knew which one was their jar, you know, it's all the same packaging. And uh, we would number them. And so then we would just put them all in the kit and you would get a kit and it'd be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way up to you could have as many as 40 entries before it became too many. And, uh, you know, sometimes you'd have 36, sometimes you'd have 22, sometimes, you'd have, you know, it'd be different numbers. And then we would redistribute those. So we would get all the entries in a matter of a few hours. Then we would make the judge's kit in a, say an hour or two and then we would redistribute those entries to the judges so like literally you're turning in your entry and you're getting your judges kit the same day so that there's no competition that i've ever heard of that did it that fast unless there were like five entries or something you know so like this was a colossal amount of entries you were getting it as fresh as possible so you turned in your hash it was the exact same hash that you turned in when we were giving it to the judges. There's no dry, nothing had happened to it. It was fast, you know? But because of that, we were also, we didn't know the testing results yet. So, you know, you were going to get some, some hash that was going to fail testing, maybe. And sometimes that happened. But uh, I think that was the, the best way for, for doing it that way. And then the integrity of, of the judges was better because you're getting this blind thing. Theoretically, you didn't know which one was yours. You might be able to pick it out sometimes, but most of the time people have bought theirs was another entry number. And, uh, and, and then if you judged, you weren't scoring your own entry. So your votes for your own numbers didn't count. So we took all your numbers. We didn't tell you which one was yours so that you didn't judge it. And then you would tell everybody which one was yours. So you scored it the same as you might have been right, you might have been wrong. I did events where people thought, oh, this one's mine, I'm gonna score it really high. And it wasn't theirs. <laughs> so, you know, there was that. There was there was those kind of things that could happen, but for the most part, we were able to kind of cut down on any sort of weird anomaly because of the way it was structured. Yeah, and then as far as the, the judging, like you had all the basics. It was like color, smell, taste. I had sensation. So that was like harshness, like smoothness. Um, effect, that would be like how high you got, whether you enjoyed it, whether it was like, eh, like whatever. And, and then like overall, I think that was it. I might have left one out there. But like, oh, consistency. Like, oh, is this like a consistency that you like or is this like – consistency that you don't like it doesn't stick to your dab or you don't like it. you know like, whatever i remember um <laughs> up in humboldt we had this uh dragonfly dem pure certified event and it was all the dem pure certified farmers and what i loved was everybody kind of threw their mason jars on this central table and over like three days you know it's like 6 30 in the morning like the sun starts coming up and people start coming out to that main common area everyone's smelling everyone else's jars and you kind of notice people gravitating and this is over the course of multiple days to like certain stuff and like there's ultimately one that like everybody has been like this is the shit. Right. And I thought that was so cool. And, and it's kind of like, it, it's, it's just a, it's a competition where it's just like, let's just put everything on the table and just see <laughs> everyone can be like, that was the, like, we all agree that dude won. Yeah. I think, so that's another thing for me as far as competitions go is like, I think there's room for like a shark tank style competition where it's essentially not really a competition where it's just you're you have like a panel of judges that are educated and people bring on their product and they show it to these people and then these people are like yeah you're on the a team or nope you didn't quite make it up to this level you got some work to do here's some things that you could improve upon and that way you're not there's less losers one of the things i hated about the secret cup and, and chalice is like 
So Chalice especially. So you get 300 entries into Chalice. Like how many winners are we going to have? Three? Maybe four or five or something like that? Like like 295 losers? That sucks. That sucks for a lot of people. And so (laughs) like as an event promoter... (laughs) You're a loser. <laughs> I don't necessarily love that idea. Like, I would love to have a judges pack that maybe we can vote on it in a different way, where it's like this thing was awesome or it wasn't, and you don't necessarily win or lose. Like, a, like the you get some feedback on your your stuff, and you know whether you're at the top of the game or if you're not there yet. And yeah, maybe you could showcase the statistics from like each something. entry at the yeah, end, like, and like. Have like a highlight for the ones that got the best results or something. I just love to cut down on the losers. You know, that's that's where I'm coming from with it. And I think there's a way. So. You're terrible. <laughs> Don't ever come back. <laughs> and, and then the other side to that, too, is like, so from an event promoter stance, like if I give people a chance to like go on stage and like promote their brand, a lot of times they're going to put money towards this thing that like, I'm not going to put money towards. So like Wiz Khalifa is coming to the stage with them and you know, like I'm not paying for that, but they're paying for that. Or they're going to give away $10,000 worth of products. And like, you know, they have a huge amount of people all like stoked now. And like, uh, I think that a lot of these event people are just doing the same events over and over and over. It's very stale and, uh, there's a lot of room to do cooler things. I think we should do those cooler things. Yeah. Can can you uh, are are there a few yeah, are there a few like underground events now that you think uh, we should watch out for in the next few years? Of course that ruins the whole underground aspect to it, but anything uh, you know, we should be on the watch out for? The, the only events that I think are cool that I've been to and in in any I mean, so there is a secret cup right now that's going on and they do some pro wrestling at the secret cup. And I, I love the pro wrestling, but the cannabis part of the secret cup, I'm not super proud of. And so, uh, I wish that them well, I'm part of it. I go to all the events, they have my full support, but, uh, you know, I'd love to see the cannabis part of those events vastly improved. Um, the events that I think are impressive are all on the East coast. Like, uh, the interpret tasting my, my friend Bobby Nuggs does, that looks like a dope event. I think that is really cool. And uh, they're just the, those kind of events, you know. I, I hate to single them out, but, like, the event to me, if it's cool, it's going to have this. It's going to have a family feel to it. It's going to have a core group of people who are good people who are not going to exclude you. They're not like on some sort of a pedestal where they're like showing off or they don't want to talk to you or they're going to be like treating you like, oh, you peasant. They're welcoming. They want to talk to you. They want to bring you in. They want to make sure that you're having a good time. They want to show you cool stuff. And and as long as you're going to an event that's like that, I think it's a cool event. And, and it doesn't really matter if they're – I, you know, I, I haven't necessarily seen any achievements in cannabis. Like we were deciding the world champion of hash. We were having people from all over the world that were the greatest hash makers in their place come together and compete. And then we were deciding who the greatest was. There's nothing like that. Nobody's doing anything even remotely close. There's a bunch of events where there might be these winners in these different places. There's no like huge international competition or like like just nothing like what we're doing there's no ufc yeah there's nothing like this like and but there's definitely cool things that i like um and i really hope that someday somebody does something where i'm like wow that's even better than what we were doing but um as far as achievements in cannabis i don't see anything remotely close but there's definitely a lot of really cool uh events and cool communities that are building that i think is wonderful i'd agree with everything you said there (laughs) well i'm super high right now (laughs) and i'm a couple beers in 
Yeah, Same I haven't here, taken man. a dab in a minute. Is that like, can I, can I take a dab? Is that okay? You, you, you should take can. a dab. I'll take one with you before we wrap this up. I'll take a dab. Otis, what are you dabbing on? Uh, puff and solventless Wi-Fi number five. And how is that? Ooh, buddy. I've also got, I've also got some uh, moonshine melts here directly from Brandon. Who does moonshine. <laughs> By the way, are are you the cu current custodian of my uh, Snow right? High? Uh, oh, your weed. Yeah. yeah. Let me get it. <laughs> yes, up this, that. Let me up this Thursday. I've got a jar for you. Let me go get that right now. So Brandon is the, the, the official champion and the current holder of the Secret Cup belt. I believe he has still has it in his possession. And and he is the rightful owner. He deserves to have it. Nice. All the uh all the nugs from uh what we were smoking that day. It's a mix. Yeah, that that that's all for me. Yeah, it's all you. Ooh. Excellent. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. This is the the snow till mix slash Peter 060922 jar. <laughs> <laughs> I like to label all my jars. This one came pre labeled, but this is another snow till GMO root beer. Now, what piece are you dabbing on? That's what I want to know. Uh, this is a lurch piece. Oh, badass. And, uh, the nail is one of the highly educated uh, quartz banger. Oh, and those rock. Hell yeah. I'm going to heat up my piece real quick. Smoke with you. Come on, Peter. Put it put it up. <laughs> Let's sesh. It's getting this guy hot enough to do like a what is almost a cold start. But I'm going to drop my rosin in. Puffin solventless, man. <laughs> We've had him. <laughs> excuse me. We've had him on here <laughs> a couple times. Just do the largest presses I've ever seen <laughs> from anybody. I'm just like, good lord. Yeah, high heat. <laughs> yeah. He's cool. We actually interviewed him this weekend. We'll have a video on future cannabis <laughs> projects soon with the talk with him talking about Hell his yeah. uh, his process and his Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Oh, dude, I'll be tuning in. And that Wi-Fi, I love, I haven't had his, but Wi-Fi's dude, on it's the good. Uh, top of my list. It's really good. Wi-Fi number five, direct from OG Rascal, who, funny enough, I seshed with down in Diamond Bar when I was just freshly, like, 18, like, what, like, eight, seven years ago or so. And he was so nice, and he had all these fancy pieces, and I just bought my first Sovereignty, and I was like, man, like, I'm with all these legends here, just at this first Sovereignty sesh. And OG Rascal was a really cool guy, and he's the guy responsible for the Wi-Fi cuts from what I understand. That's how I understand it too. Just see the rig a little more. Oh, dude. You can kind of see it. Badass. Thing there. And then I also have a torch. Oh, sick. Custom made. So. That's so fucking sick, dude. They're kind of matching. Legendary. Yeah. <laughs> so, back so when people cared about me. That was a good ass dab, man. I was on mute there. Those are badass, badass pieces, though. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, those are sick, man. All right, so that's Puffin. And then, Jeremy, what did you have? Oh, I had a Lurch rig with a Puffin Dab's torch. Yeah, old school. Different Puffin, Puff Dash N, right? <laughs> yeah, that's Emerge. If you oh, know Emerge. Him. Yeah, Emerge. He was legendary for taking enormous dabs. So sick. So, uh, legendary torches so he was he was the torch artist of the day he was at all our events pretty much made quite a lot of the uh awards he made all the original awards so cool man that's a legendary torch thank you yeah for real 
yeah, I'm very pleased that it still works. And uh, yeah, my blazer's been going like fuck, like six years strong, seven years strong. Damn. <laughs> I have one of those. Thousands <laughs> of dabs. I've been taking off of this. <laughs> Yeah, most of my rigs are all put away. Like my yeah, my, uh, my fascination with the glass game has uh, it's not what it used to be, and so totally. now I just basically want to have like I kind of want to sell off most of my collection and just have like maybe four or five different really nice pieces. Yeah, core collection. Yeah, yeah, it's um it's been interesting for me going from being a collector then to like blowing glass for the last four years. And like, I haven't bought any new pieces since I started blowing glass. Right. So as soon as you become a glass blower, then you, you smoke out of a broken rig. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> dude, all the pieces I have like are like all flawed, but I sold all my really beautiful ones. Yeah. That's what every single <laughs> glass blower I know. Yeah. Yeah, man. Then you always go like, oh, I'm going over to Darby's house. <laughs> you know, like, this is, no. <laughs> hilarious. Yeah, dude, Paul Troutman, uh, my, he's awesome, man. He's, he's like family, man. He's uh, super tight with my family up in uh, Oregon. And uh, whenever I go over to his crib, uh, it's hilarious because his shelves are just lined with these legendary rigs from like Marcel Braun and like Liberty 503 and like all these like, you know, incredible other glass blowers. It's just, his house is just, the shelves are lined with them. It's crazy. And he doesn't dab. Like it's just because it's all these gifts that he gets from all the people that use his color. Yeah. Just like, oh, I put them on the shelf. <laughs> there was an event promoter that threw a very prestigious high end glass uh, event. And I remember going over to his house and I went in his kitchen and he had like just what you described. Yeah, totally. So no, like it was like a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of glass. Yeah. And it was so dusty and there were cobwebs. And I was like, can yeah, I like Braun, Depe, Yushin, I, like <laughs> please take a picture of this? And I was like, no. And then the next time I came over, it was spotlessly clean. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, there's like a giant like cowboy bubbler like hanging on like a metal frame like on top of like the like one of the cabinets just in the living room. Like it's it's you know he's and and he's been like, dude, you gotta sell that thing for me, man. Like <laughs> I don't smoke out of it. The glass world is there's there's like a bunch of those out there. Like yeah, man. I used to get way into it for a minute, and then they just got this collection. Through that. Yeah. True that, true that. It's amazing art, you know, like I, I still, um, when I look at glass art, I think it is one of the art forms that speaks the loudest to me. I don't know if it's because of the pipe association, but like when I see an extremely impressive uh, borosilicate specifically uh, glass piece, whether it's functional or not, uh, that does i have like an emotional reaction to that dude it's, it's captivating for sure it's, it's super captivating the other kind of art and i love a lot of art I'm, i love art but um that glass art uh there's something special about it totally yeah totally i agree i agree for sure dude i i feel that connection and also once you start like melting and making glass too it's like it's it flips it and twists it and then like you know you feel that love on like another crazy level for the art yeah i me mean, just having glass blower friends i feel like i've touched on that yeah definitely yeah 100 percent. i'm really excited to see the uh upcoming documentary yeah thank you yeah, yeah of course and i'll i'd be happy to put you in touch with paul too i'm sure he'd yeah. be really excited to talk with you about that my plan is to do like a little bit on the history, but then I, I kind of want to get into niche parts of glass that people don't focus a lot on. So like, um, that's exciting. Yeah. Like, so, you know, Millie, um, maybe one of my friends sells opals. Oh yeah, totally. That, uh, maybe, uh, faceting that, so just like kind of some of the other stuff that doesn't really get a lot of love that I, like I personally know some people that do it. And so I could easily kind of um, do those kind of things, kind of put my friends forward. A, a lot of what I like to do also is like 
because I have this platform that um, I want to celebrate the people that I want to see be successful. Oh, that's great. Yeah, totally. I want banjo in my glass blowing movie, but like, I'm, I'm not like, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to make a successful movie because banjo is in it. I'm trying yeah. to make a movie about something. And then um, if I can help the people that, uh, that are helping me, then great. That's, <laughs> that's really good. Totally. That's the, that's the move. It's the way to do it. It's a good move, man. High tide raises all ships. True that. True that. Yeah, I've always been one to, to collaborate with, with other people. I feel like um, we are far stronger together. And whenever I've had problems with things, it's, it's almost always uh, because there becomes some sort of an internal conflict. And it's just never really successful in my eyes. Like, um, there's always a, um, a better reason for us to work together, you know? I feel that, man. I feel that. The colla the nature of collaboration is uh, also incredibly important for like achieving a goal. You know, uh, it's always better to do it with a team. It's, it's fun, and you might, you know, everybody probably relate to this one too. You know, Jeremy, it's like when when you're in the gym or you know whatever you're doing. If the person next to you isn't giving up, when you kind of want to quit, you're not going to quit because the person next to you is still going. Yeah, that even just having a trainer. True like, that. For the martial arts tie-in for me. We've oh, done I totally some relate to that. Films, yeah. And, and uh, having a trainer to push you, to just tell you that you can do more. And, and you will, you know. Definitely. <laughs> are are you going to do more, Peter? Are you up for more? How are you doing up there? <laughs> I'm ready to call it a night. Yeah, cool. for I'm, sure, for sure. I'm past my bedtime, but this has been a rad conversation. So I know this is this is so excellent. <laughs> thank you all. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, if, for everybody listening, like my website is theskyisland.com. You can get all of my films and all of my contact info and information about our awards and everything about my filmmaking. It's all there, theskyisland.com. And then the thing that you can do to help me as a filmmaker the absolute most is to go to imdb.com and to rate my movies on IMDb. <laughs> and it doesn't even matter if you rate them highly or lowly. Just go there and rate them, please. <laughs> just do anything. Just vote. Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> to that, through that. Well, that was awesome. awesome. That was incredible. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. And and I'd be more than happy to come back. In fact, I wanted to mention- Let's do it. So uh, there's actually two versions of that Secret Cup movie. <clears throat> so you guys watched the full length feature presentation that we professionally made with my current filmmaking partners. But I have another one that I can put on YouTube but I can't sell it to our distributors because I don't have releases signed by everybody <laughs> that was in it. And there's certain things that I just wasn't able to get cleared, but we can put it on YouTube. So <laughs> if you want to uh, show yeah. so, But is it like 98% the exact same as it? No, it's almost 98% a totally different thing. Oh, that's wow. amazing. Sick. Yeah. Director's I mean, I'm I, I, Yeah, I'm intrigued oh, and let's do it. <laughs> That'll be next Tuesday. Yeah, man. Cool. I love it. A then week we'll have from today. <laughs> It'll be the same movie, just a completely different version. Yeah, there's <laughs> Sick. almost all different music, almost nice. all wow. different scenes. Like, there's a, it's a small, maybe 10% overlap, but wow. like almost all different. Yeah. That's, That's really cool. exciting. That's really exciting. I'm into that. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's cool. like a um, like a like a like a reggae rhythm, rhythm. Exactly, rhythm. So like, so yeah. like, just Evolving. different people like sing over the top of it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of yeah. like that. 
Fuck yeah. I yeah, this that. is the one we made ourselves, and then we were trying to take this to Netflix and everywhere else to like get it somewhere. But when I finally got it to the right eyes, they were like, "We need a little something more." So let's make a whole. And they're, you know, they're all filmmakers too. They're like, "We don't want to make the same movie. We have enough. We'll make a different thing." So, you know, that can be its own thing. And we're gonna make something else, and and I love how it all turned out. All right, so we're going to play a totally different movie next Tuesday night. Hell yes. And then have a sim- this same post-movie conversation about the different movie. Let's sure. <laughs> do it. Sure. You can we're do like, it. we've never That's talked totally before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can I'm remember down. all the things you forgot to ask me. Right, of which <laughs> there will be many. Do that, do yeah. that. All right. All right. Chad. Yeah. You want to yes. take us out? All Let's right, everybody. Great night. That was excellent. Awesome talking with you all. Everybody yeah, that in was, chat. That was such a good night, honestly. And what a what a good movie night. What a good conversation. Peace out, everybody. I, li- I like that you have the LED lights behind you. Oh, yeah, exactly. The, like Strung Christmas up, right? lights. <laughs> it's very festive. Yeah, it, it's funny. My, my like little apartment is like uh, underneath a house in Silver Lake. It's like the second floor. So to keep it from feeling too much like you're like under a house or like in the basement, I try to at least like spruce it up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? We <laughs> so do have a nice... me into thinking that I actually have light. Exactly. But we do have... Uh, over here, there is quite a nice little balcony where I've got my Traeger smoker and my uh, barbecue and stuff. <laughs> so it's not too Robert. much of a hobbit hole. <laughs> Amazing. Robert. Yeah. All right. With, with that revelation, we'll end it. <laughs> All right, guys. Good night, good night. everybody. <laughs>